Good evening and welcome to the February 12th School Board Budget Workshop number one. Um, some housekeeping before we start. First of all, I'd like to thank Chris Hayden, who is doing our filming this evening. Um, we had a discussion about that, and we're trying to get this on our website and or somewhere so that um, other people can watch it when, when they wish to. Um, a couple other housekeeping issues. Um, I think you normally see Ann Swift Chaota here at these meetings, and her dad passed away unexpectedly today. So she will not be here this evening, just in case you're wondering, and if you want to send her your best wishes, I'm sure she'd appreciate that. Time frame. I think everybody has an agenda in front of them. If they don't, there are extras somewhere. They're down on the side table. Down on the side table. Dwight's probably passing them out, right, Dwight? Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> so this is a school board workshop. It's for the school board to hear from the administrators who are presenting tonight um, and for the school board members to ask questions. At the end of the evening, there will be a time for public comment. We're going to try to hold that to 15 minutes unless there's a tremendous amount of people here. Um, and I guess with that, um, we're going to have a one, um, one change from our agenda, one adjustment. Um, Trish would like to say a few words. The other thing I'd like to tell you is there are three microphones on the table. Um, in order for Chris to get this um, accurately, you need to turn the microphone on. But if I believe, before you do that, I believe that if you have more than one on at a time, there's you some You can have them all on at the same time, but... You can have but them. But don't forget, I can pick up your conversation. Yes, so, <laughs> so be careful what you say. So no saying things that you wouldn't exactly. want to have public. Um, so <laughs> please do try to use the microphones when you please do try to use the microphones when you speak, so that we can be sure that everything's recorded. Thank you, Trish. Um, I just wanted to let my fellow board members know, I guess, and everyone else that last week um, I had set up a meeting with board chairs from Yarmouth. Cumberland and Falmouth just to sort of reach out and talk and get talk, see what other people were doing with um, the budget and um, consolidation and everything else and I think it was a great first meeting I'm hoping we'll be able to do it again and just to share some of the highlights that we, we had no particular agenda um, but Yarmouth has started their budget process they do it a little bit differently than we do and they're looking at something a little bit like a three percent increase Falma thought they would have a nominal increase and Cumberland hasn't begun. I, one thing I did find very interesting is their processes are different than ours in that there is no 0% um, target, so to speak, hanging over them. They prepare their budgets for what they need and it's a little bit different than our process. So um, we talked a little bit. Falmouth had some, I, some interesting ideas on how they were handling the curtailment in hopes that they would not have to cut positions and at this point they weren't. Um, they had introduced two and a half day kindergarten to avoid the middle of the day bus run. They've eliminated buses for um, athletic events, which has policy implications so that when kids go to a, an athletic event, most of them ride home with their parents, so they're not providing buses. So I'm not advocating that, but it was kind of interesting hearing some of the things that they're doing. Um, I just thought I would share that. If we meet again and anyone has any other ideas, I'd be happy to pass it on. I just thought it was good to kind of collaborate and exchange ideas with other communities. Did you say they had done two and a half days? They're, they're looking, seriously looking into that. Actually, in both um, Cumberland, Yarmouth is also in the midst of, or beginning of, of superintendent search, and Falmouth. as is Falmouth. So both of those communities will be looking for new superintendents. Thank you, Trish. Um, don't forget to turn on your mic down there if you're going to speak, um, just because I want to make sure that Tr Chris can pick you up. Um, and uh, just one other housekeeping, I want to thank Linda for bringing brownies and cookies tonight to just kind of keep us on the, in the happy mode. So um, <laughs> without further ado, I'll turn this over to the overview of the budget by the superintendent. Thank you very much. What I am going to do uh, this evening for a short time is just to do an overview of what the budget is and how we got to where we are tonight. I did some of that uh, the other night at the open board meeting on Tuesday, but I think because we are being filmed, I think it's important for the public to understand. 
The budget that each board member has in front of them is called the initial superintendent's budget. By the way we do budgets is the first step is the superintendent puts together a budget working with his administrators in order to take a look at the system and look at what is needed. Part of that process is working with uh, our school board in order to set some goals for us as far as the route we were going to go. The goal that was set this year as only a goal is a 2% increase. It's important to take a look at that because there are some things built into the budget which we have to take into consideration. The first one is the figures for contract, contracted negotiations and health insurance. At this point in time, uh, as we have readjusted and readjusted the budget, we are at a $1,106,640 increase needed in order to maintain staffing as the, at the same way it is now. That staffing ranges from the superintendent right straight through the school system. So that is an important piece of the puzzle. By adding 2% to the budget figures from last year, we still are aware of the fact that we have gained some money. We've gained $395,752, but we still have $716,000 to cut or to find a different place for. And I think that's very important for everyone to understand as we build this process. Um, it has been an interesting week. I've had meetings with several different people. I've had some groups come in to see me. I've had some people contact me by phone, et cetera. One of, the, one of the things that I have learned, and I learned this as a new superintendent seven years ago, is that no matter what you do, you don't satisfy everyone. And we have to buy that and understand that process as we go through it. I have heard in the last few days from people who have come in to see me to say, Alan, you would be very smart to talk the board into doing either a zero or a negative one percent budget. I've been very clear that's not my job. I am hired by the board. I represent the board. I do the initial budget and then it comes to the point of the board itself takes a look at the budget and makes those final decisions. I have had other people in, to, in the last few days who told me that they looked at the budget and they feel we only made poor decisions. We didn't really think it through. I have been very clear with those people. They have no idea of how much time we have spent as an administrative team in looking at the budget and looking at every side of the budget and every piece of the budget. Are there things in here you're going to like? No. Are there things you're going to want to change? Probably. But the baseline is this. You are now moving from the stage of having a superintendent's budget to the point of developing the school board's budget, which will be presented to the town council. Uh, they've complained because we haven't set priorities. I look around at the administrators, and I think any one of them would tell you, we have spent hours setting priorities and deciding what our priorities are. Have we all agreed? No. Should we have all agreed? No, because we had so many pieces of the puzzle to look at. Uh, what I have also found and what has become very clear to me is we are constant talk about, constantly talk about transparency and unfortunately transparency is a very difficult process. The background of things that have been done, we have to spend time and energy on to make sure that there is understanding. I had some very interesting meetings where uh, that I was told that we weren't doing certain things. We were allowing certain teachers to teach who shouldn't be teaching. I was told we were allowing certain things to go on that were, should not be going on. I am very clear to them is I have worked very hard as have my administrators to ensure that we can consistently look at our curriculum and make sure we're doing the best, best job we can. But to the board tonight, you're beginning a difficult process. Uh, the administrators will tell you we have gone through a very difficult process for the last several months. Uh, but we understand that it is a process and we need to get to the bottom line of the process. So that's where you are tonight. Tonight you will have the opportunity to hear from, uh, from four of your administrators. The way we have divided it up is we'll do four tonight and we'll do four next Tuesday. What they will do and uh, I've been watching watches laid down beside a uh, table. I have told them very clearly they need to make their presentation in no more than seven minutes. And then after they've made their presentation about their budget, 
Then what they will do is talk about questions that have come from school board members to them about specific areas of the budget. Uh, the questions have come in from almost all of you. Uh, I know some of you uh, wrote answers. I did get a hold of the people and say you do not have to send written answers unless you have statistics <clears throat> that need to be brought in. So there will be those answers given tonight and I'm sure more questions will result from those answers. And so we will deal with that as, uh, this evening. And if we come to questions we don't have statistics on, we will come back Monday, I mean Tuesday after vacation with that information as best we can. In my uh, section of the budget, which is a seven-page section that is supposed to give an overview of where we are, one of the pieces that I use very carefully is the written word of each of my administrators because they are the ones who know their buildings the best. I was a middle school administrator for many years. I felt I knew my building the best. I was an elementary principal for many years. I felt I knew my building the best. So they are the ones who will talk about their buildings and or their programs and what they are. However, in building this, I have taken a look at several th things that I think need to be stressed as we go through the budget. The first thing I would ask you to do, if you look at page three, and if I could get to page three, we'd be doing well. One of the things that I looked at very carefully is because of some constant discussion around the number of teachers we have based on the number of students we have. There is a piece to this puzzle which I have spoken about over and over again and that is leadership. Leadership of buildings, leadership of the system comes from administrators. But we have also become very clear in the fact that teacher leadership is also a very important part of what we do. And we have teacher leadership in all three schools. We have some that is still very active. We have some that is not as active. But I'm not going to go through these step by step, but I would say if you look at Pond Cove, you look at the Pond Cove teacher leader, a position that was put in several years ago when you stopped having an assistant principal there. You have the mathematics teacher leader, which came about at, because of a grant from CEF to support mathematics programs from K through 2. You have reading recovery, early literacy program, which is a combination of people who've been trained in uh, reading recovery, but also are there to spend the other half of their day looking at early literacy to again make sure our students are well prepared as young learners to take the next steps in their education. At Cape Elizabeth, uh, Cape Elizabeth Middle School, you have had uh, English language arts and science teacher leaders part time for two years. Unfortunately, those positions will cease to exist for next year. However, you do have a math team leader who was, again, provided by CEF, who is doing a great deal of work in that area. The English language arts and science teachers have spent an enormous amount of time both developing and reviewing curriculum, assessment, and instruction. And that is an extremely important piece to our puzzle and have worked directly with teachers. At Cape Elizabeth High School, you have the Achievement Center, which was brought in five years ago through CEF. Uh, we have had to take some cuts in that program, but the Achievement Center still continues to exist and will still continue to provide services for all level of students, from those who truly struggle to those who are AP students. We also have, as of this last year, the Reading Literacy Teacher Leader, based on facts that uh, Jeff was able to pull together around understanding reading literacy. So those are very important pieces and I often get lost in the discussion. You'll also recognize the fact that there are some other pieces that we, have had, we need to look at. We need to look at data-driven research. I am more and more convinced as time goes on that if we do not use our data wisely, we do not understand what's going on. <clears throat> I have had members of the board say we need to take a look at every curriculum area carefully and see what the information is. That information is not, needs to be done by data. What do we know, what do we understand, and what are we going to use? We have tried for two years to get a CEF grant to do data. Unfortunately, we did not get the CEF grant either year. Fortunately, we were able to hire a person half time to start developing a data process for us. And so we are in that process. And that data information will play a very important role as we move ahead. Professional development, 
Uh, one of the pieces of the puzzle has constantly been that we hire the best teachers to do the best job and provide them the best support we possibly can. Professional development is an extremely important part of that. It, is, it goes along with a parallel of if you go to a doctor, you certainly hope they've had the best training possible. When you have a teacher who is working with students to educate students, you want them to have the, mo the best, most recent training that is available. We look at technology. I, I know the board agrees very strongly that technology needs to be a baseline of our curriculum for the future. We have some serious work to do in this area, but we also have quality leadership that will help us do that as we readjust our guidelines as we move ahead. In the budget, you will find one addition, and you will have to think about that carefully. That one addition is a quarter-time nurse at the high school. That one addition is based on what we are seeing as the changing physical roles of students and what they need from our nurses. And so this is one I have added to the budget. It is one I'm sure you're going to want to discuss and think about and decide whether that's the best way to go or where you would like to go otherwise. I look at the, at the funding itself. Uh, I'm, I'm very clear that we have an expenditure budget, but we also must have a budget that shows money that comes into the system. Uh, there are many ways that comes in. One is from our undesignated funds. Each year, we have some funds that have not been spent, as does the town, and out of that undesignated fund, money is then goes over to the budget. For the first time in many years, we have much less than we have had in the past because of demands on the budget. So we probably have about a hundred to a hundred and fifty thousand dollars when we get to the final figures for that as opposed to the 250 we've had in the past. For general purpose aid to education, if you've been watching the newspapers, if you've been listening to the discussions, you know the, we have been told very clearly general purpose aid to education will not be any higher than it is this year and will probably be lower. We also know that in, for the 09 budget, the budget why we are currently spending, we had a $421,000 cut. We are understanding right now that that same cut, another cut like that, will be in the fiscal year 09-10 budget and probably in the fiscal year 10-11. So we are, must prepare for that and know what that is. We also look at miscellaneous revenues. We have had some miscellaneous revenues which we have not had in the past and some we will have and we'll take a look at those figures as we work our way through the budget. We also look at expenditures and it is a, a tricky road when we take a look at expenditures. One of them, as you heard me say in the beginning, we talk about negotiated salaries and fringe benefits. Part of the fringe benefits are health insurance. Health insurance previously has been based on, for all staff, based on the health insurance rates of the year before. In order to make some changes in the, in the negotiations, in order to save some money, this past year we have negotiated that we will set, set the uh, health rates based on this current year's set of um, amount of money. We don't know that amount of money. That doesn't usually come in until late March, early May, uh, early April, excuse me. So what we have done is we've had to build the budget based on a 20% estimate. My hope is that is much larger than it needs to be, but we don't know that and won't know it until the figures come in from the state. Uh, Ernie McVeigh and Pauline have worked consistently to save us energy money. This year, as you know, it was a very, has been a very expensive energy year so, this, so far because of the costs. Surprisingly, our oil company has allowed us to set a contract for next year, for 0910. That contract is at $1.94 a gallon. That has brought some good savings to us in the area of energy for 0910. We have applied for a 128,000 uh, grant based on uh, work that was done in the last two years. Uh, we are waiting, <coughs> excuse me, my voice is going quickly here. We are waiting for that to go to the town council. If that money comes through, that money will circle around to help manage some of the work we have to do on our properties. In conclusion, what I would say to you, and 
the administrators would agree with me. There are a lot of unknowns. We always deal with unknowns as we're working our way through the process. But we work with them as best we can. We make adjustments as we move along, as we see what they are, so that those adjustments are made before the final budget is passed, because the final budget becomes the final dollar amount. Whether it is at a 2 percent, or a 0 percent, or a negative 1 percent, or a 4 percent, whatever it is, that becomes the bottom amount. Therefore, I, I look at you as board members as having a difficult job ahead. You've got a lot of questions. You need some answers. You need some background information. We are going to do everything we can to do that. We have worked very carefully at looking at the questions we already have and what it means. Uh, one last statement is if you'll turn to page 8 of your budget, you will get a financial overview as we know it right now. And I, I say that very carefully because in the four years I've been here, that is never today the correct amount at the end based on where money comes from and how it gets redistributed. But if you look at the chart and if you look at 2009, 2010, and then the change, we are looking at if we have, get the goal of a 2 percent increase, our budget would go to $20,183,331. Or it is a $395,752 increase or a 2 percent increase. If you follow uh, information down, you will see that our state revenue is done at $2,654,038, estimated because we don't know that yet. And we probably won't get that information for at least another month from the state. But it is down 421,572. Our undesignated balance surplus, as I said a little while ago, normally has been 250,000. We are hoping we'll have 150,000 in order to make that. If you look at our miscellaneous funds, we have just received money from Medicaid that is 0708 money. And so we now have on the books, $154,810, more than what we expected. Uh, state agency clients, we have some money there for state agency clients. We know we have lost some of that population. We are estimating that that's where we will be. And you look at the high school athletic fees, we have the $43,000. Uh, under revenue subtotals, you will see um, that we are looking at subtotals of a negative 11.72% which means that with these figures, the local property tax at a 2 percent based on all of these figures, which will be adjusted as we go along, will be a 4.89 percent increase. Uh, you look at the computation of the tax rate, you will see the figures and you will see there is a change of an increase of 0.83 percent. The mill raised will be 12.84 percent and you will see what they tell us about the property tax for education based on what is considered a median price house in Cape Elizabeth. This is overview information. I will repeat again, I don't want to sound like a teacher, but I'm going to sound like one anyway, that this is beginning information. It is not final. We will continue to finalize it as we continue to get information from the state, from the local government as we move ahead. This is the projected 2 percent budget which you gave me the direction to do. I appreciate very much your guidance in order to do that because we needed to have a place to start from. As I told you earlier, I have had people who have told me to try to get you to a zero or a negative one. I have people who have tried to tell me to get you to a four percent. I have had people who have told me we've done a bad job. I've had some people who told me we did a good job, which is always nice to hear. And I know we have lack of background information. Tonight, on the night of the 24th, and possibly the night of the 26th, we're going to try to give you as much accurate information as possible as we move ahead, as you try to make the decisions that you need to make in this process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. Um, and we're going to start with the um, we're going to start with the um, presentations by the um, administration and I believe, unless I'm corrected, that what we're going to do is like, for instance, we're going to start with Tom Eismeyer at Pond Cove. He's going to do his presentation and then questions that you have for Tom 
um, will do, and then we'll go along so that you get a chance to ask the questions of the different administrators um, you know, as they're after they're presenting, but give them a chance to do their presentation. Is that? That's correct. They'll, okay. They'll do up to seven minutes of a presentation. Okay. And, a and just a reminder that. Um, just a reminder that I know it's a little awkward, but we have to use these um, uh, microphones. So if you're going to, if you try to jump in and ask a question, if you could just grab for the microphone first, so that we can be sure that we get it all on tape. Rebecca, you have a question. Pete, no. Alan, when would you like uh, questions, general questions, on just some more number? Recognizing the fact that we're going to be pretty tight process. Uh, if we could hold those until either if we get done early tonight or next time, uh, send the questions to me also. But it would be helpful if you did that just because I'm, I don't want to get into conversations that are going to eat up the time we need to use tonight, if that's okay. Oh, never mind. Actually, um, I'm not going to because I see the information right there. Thank you. Okay. We all set now? Okay. Well, well then we'll turn it over to Tom Eismeyer and the Pong Cove presentation. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, and uh, thank you to Alan for bringing up the important points about this uh, budget process. I'm sure the people in the room know, but other people might need to be reminded that the obligation to uh, honor the contracts for salary and benefit increase was $1.1 million, which means that the 2% increase by that calculus, we still have to cut up to $700,000 to get the 2%. Following up from that, I'm sure you know, but you, you might not know exactly how we did it. Pauline figured out a formula for what each administrator is responsible for and allocated that, in Pond Cove's case, by the percentage of what we have in the total budget. Uh, having said that, I don't think it's uh, any surprise to anybody here that we all know that the economic landscape has changed radically in the past year. Nobody has any illusions that we will be asking for huge increases, but we're doing the best we can to keep what we have. Uh, the other important point I hope comes out, that although I did go through this budget line by line, I was trying to keep the big picture in my head at the same time. If I've slipped, I'm sure you can tell me tonight. I, I've also noticed from the questions that you forwarded to me, you have read the documents very carefully. So I hope as we go through, I can answer the questions that have already been forwarded to me. I've grouped those, um, and I, I think you're following my logic very carefully. Class size, reading support, that uh, notably reading recovery, questions about allied arts, and staff development. I think as I go through, I will probably answer those questions, but you can follow up later. So my priority, if you t turn to page two in the Pond Cove section, we've learned over the years from working at, a, at an elementary school and from doing various exercises about the future of the school that the biggest value at Pond Cove and any other el elementary school is to keep class size reasonable. So when I'm doing the budget, I try to work in towards that, nibble at the edges and work toward class size. Closely related to class size at Pond Cove and any, any elementary school is the amount of support that teachers need to help every kid meet the standards before they leave Pond Cove. That gets to programs like Reading Recovery. Reading Recovery um, is obligated, we do the, try to see at least the bottom 20% of first grade that's 27 students that the three teachers do per year. But in addition to that, they have been a very powerful staff development force in the school since they started at Pond Cove probably 15 years ago. 
In addition to that, as Alan mentioned, the reading teachers see, um, see kids right up through grade uh, four. So it's K through four with a concentration on K1, but it's a very, very important part of our staff development. Um, so when I looked at, at class size, you'll notice that I put grade one for next year at about 20, which would be higher than the ones for grade four. My logic was that at that level, the grade one teachers had the support not only of the reading recovery teachers and reading teachers, but the math lab. And as the kids go up through, particularly uh, in grades three and four, they do not have this much support outside the classroom. I'm leaving aside instructional support, which is, is a separate, uh, uh, Dominic will talk about that. So when you looked at the class size of 19 in grade four, that in my mind was to keep that balance. If we go with one fewer teacher there, it would put it up pretty high. And again, from my perspective, with a lack of support in math, that would probably have an impact on the teacher's ability to do what we call differentiation this day, uh, these days. So that, that's the biggest value, I think. And uh, it turned out that we have a, a cost reduction in uh, teachers because with declining enrollment, we'll need one fewer teacher at Pond Cove. So moving on, again, uh, touching on what uh, Alan mentioned, um, we, and of course you've read it, we do, we have a designated uh, teacher leader at, at uh, Pond Cove. Um, our former one was a reading recovery teacher. And that allows uh, more support for kids and more support for teachers throughout the building. Our math lead teacher functions in a similar way. I've already mentioned how the reading teachers co contribute to that. Not that I'm saying that we should do these this year, but I, I just want to remind you that we did have plans that we've had to uh, put on hold or perhaps abandon forever. I'm not suggesting in any way that we, we should fund them this year, but maybe down the road we'll be able to expand health. Uh, these other things that I've been bringing to your attention for years and years, um, school guidance or counselor would be up to two from 1.5. World language would be throughout the school. And uh, you did ask questions about technology. Uh, our survey showed that Pond Cove is sort of down the bottom with technology in terms of equipment, I think. Um, and some of you asked what, what our strategy is. Our, the strategy of Pond Cove would be to invest in staff development. We do, uh, thanks to Gary, we are getting more equipment, notably more smart boards. But we do have websites. We do have our um, progress reports, which are online now. It's a matter of time and support for teachers to be able to use this more, more systematically, in my view. And just to mention um, losses that we've had before. When the kindergarten moved to Pond Cove years ago, um, we dropped the ed tech in that position. And as I, we, we used to have uh, designated math support in grades three and four, but with the change in the ELL position, we no longer have that. So what I did was go through, try to protect um, the core values as I saw them. And by consulting with Alan and Pauline, um, I think I managed to reach my targeted figure. If I could take just a minute also to mention that, one of the things that we did need to look at is we had some other cuts that we were considering at that point in time. Working with uh, Dwight Ely and the uh, Education Association, we were able to look at some rearrangement of funds. Uh, two of those rearrangements is we did cut uh, the amount of reimbursement for staff uh, courses that they take. We did also cut some substitute pay at that point in time as a beginning. That cut allowed us to keep a staffing situation there that we thought we were going to have to drop. And so when we originally looked at Tom's budget, Tom's budget would have been almost $118,000 cut. But in doing that, we look at programs. I looked at them K through 12, and I felt very strongly that this was an important place to maintain. And so we did that at that point in time. So you will see a major difference between what Tom had to do at the end as opposed to what Steve has done and as opposed to what Jeff has done. But it was to preserve a program at that point in time. Thanks. And I, I think that might answer one of the emails, too. I should also mention some of the emails made um, other suggestions. 
Um, I'm a realist. This budget could go lower, go lower. So those suggestions have been on my mind. I just did not want to reveal them until, since they involved staffing, until I had to do that. Thank you, Tom. Sounds like it. I'm on. Yep. Um, questions for Tom. Um, and I don't know, do you want to have Tom address questions that he's already been sent? Or I know he sounded like he addressed some I, of them. I tried to at least generally do it, but I'd be happy to field them. Um, Tom, just one of the questions, the class size projections for 2009-2010, I was curious if they were including children of faculty who live outside of CAPE. Yes. Yeah. And, and I'm very glad to hear that because my yeah. next question was going to be um, my concern over the negative impact on it, attracting and retaining the best possible staff for the Cape Elizabeth schools, which I know is one of our key goals. And I, I would agree with you. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know the exact figure. It's probably six kids, and it would not make a major difference in class size. And I okay. think the benefit for keeping teachers outweighs that. Great. Um, then I also had the question, um, if you would just maybe explain a little more detail. I know one of the um, goals that has been identified by the school board is to better integrate existing technology with curriculum and staff development. Could you explain in a little more detail how that's reflected in your budget? I know you touched upon it just now. It, 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 it took me a while to come to the conclusion that kids, little kids don't really need laptops. But we, we actually we have some... Um, a mobile lab for grades three and four, which is not used by the little kids. Um, when we first started doing that, Gary was very helpful in helping people do that. It's the, it's the ease of use that's the best thing. Um, the smart boards installed in the classroom are right in front of teachers, and we now have six of them. And those teachers are willing to share that information to do that. We're also, Debbie Butterworth last year used her, some of her grant money to see what other schools are doing. We're ho I'm hoping with, with Gary's support that we can do more on the spot support for people. People who want to use a website, people who would like to, uh, instruction and smart board, it will, will get that um, directly related to the instruction. Um, I think you know that fourth grade teacher Eric Nielsen is doing an after school program, which is work. That. Yeah, he do, once a week. He he's been doing at teacher requests. He has he started with a teacher websites to help people be more comfortable with now with that. Now he is uh, responding to requests for help with spreadsheets and so on, and he's going to keep doing that. So would that be part of the staff development piece. Yeah. That. Um, Okay, and any other plans? I mean, will we eventually maybe get a little more specific detail on how, um, you know, like what you'll be doing with staff de de development? That would be one excellent example, but anything else just to see how that technology yeah, is Yeah, and, and, and Alan mentioned the, the data analysis and use, and we're now that we, we have more access to it um, through Gary and Dean's work, I think staff development around that would be useful too. I think that's it for now. I would just like to speak to one thing that uh, uh, Karen asked about, and that is students who come into the district who are not residents of Cape Elizabeth. Consistently, it has been dealt with in the fact that if they are the children of student of uh, teachers, and often children of people who are not teachers, they will be granted res resident student placement by a superintendent's agreement if they come to us not bringing extra needs to the buildings, et cetera. However, I need to be very clear with you. I have not granted any waivers for next year at this point. I haven't turned them off, but I feel to be very fair to you as board members. As you make decisions around what your school system is going to look like next year, I need to be very careful about what I am granting, whether it is to teachers' children or people uh, outside the community, until we see exactly where we are. Currently, I have 20 requests for students to attend Cape Elizabeth schools who are not residents of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, somebody said this to me the other day, so I want to clarify this. I am not doing this to be unfair to teachers. I'm not doing this to be unfair to other people. 
I am doing this because I feel I must financially keep close tabs on where we are financially as we make decisions. I have talked with the people who are teachers. Uh, some have come over to talk with me and I have said, I'm not saying no to you. I'm saying it is on hold at this point. I need to know where the school board is going to be at the end of their budget hearings. And I think for protection of you, it is absolutely necessary because, for instance, uh, if I get three or four second grade students, which moves the populations up over 23, 24, then you are going to have to look at, do we hire an ed tech to support them? What do we do? And I need to be very clear with you, I have not built money into the budget to do any of that kind of support services. So I want to be very clear on that because I want you to understand that I must be very, very cautious of funds as we move our way into this very difficult financial period. So that is where I am right now. If you choose to okay those, I need to tell you that your okay could possibly, based on who might move into the town, who might be requesting, it could possibly put class sizes up to a point where you need extra help in the classes or extra teachers. So I am being cautious at this point in time of your finances. I, I think I'm, I remembered, uh, remembered a few questions that came by email. It was about Allied Arts and it's related to enrollment. The Allied Arts rotation is not just for the instruction in the Allied Arts, but it also provides teachers with a common planning time once a week. And there was a question about the substitute. In order for it to work, because the numbers get a little strange with six or seven, we, ha we have a sub that comes in to take over a class so teachers have common planning time. With the number of classroom teachers we had this year, we were caught in between a five and six day rotation. So at Allied Arts teachers have either four or five classes a day. The uh, librarian uh, media center specialist, I mean, takes up um, more time by having the kindergarten come on a regular basis. And uh, another question was, how long is the library open virtually all day? It's open, um, I've seen kids down there at 20 after eight and the, the library's in use all day. The difference between uh, the Pond Cove Library and libraries in other elementary schools is that the library is a, a teaching library and the kids go down there and get direct instruction, which puts uh, more of a burden on the ed techs, there was a question about that, to keep the library running. The, the um, ed techs, we have two, then I think it amounts to a full-time job because they share it. The ed techs take care of circulation, AV, um, billing, and all those other things that allow the media center specialist to be a teacher. Other questions for Tom? The reading recovery, what happens to the numbers if you reduce that staff to two as opposed to three? We'd, we'd be in what, um, we wouldn't be in full implementation as, it call, as it's called. It, it, when we started way back when, even before I got here, I think it was uh, done on a pilot basis. How one teacher could see nine kids. The, the reading recovery model is to look at the, the lower 20%, which fits right in with RTI. So we would be below that 20% obligation to do that. Also, it's a half-time part, so if we drop reading recovery uh, I guess I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you ask further questions it's well, I'm just I, I and maybe it, the positions have been reduced but Pond Cove the population has decreased over the past couple of years and the staffing has not changed in reading recovery so were we not fulfilling all of the needs three to five years ago Are those um, teachers being utilized and deployed in different capacities I know I I guess trying to understand how it fits into RTI, the you're, whole picture. You're right on both counts. If, if, if we had a, a first grade population of 140 or 150, and we had some big ones before, then it, it was very tough to be able to do that, and it caused some frustration and stress. As the population has gone down a little bit with, a, um, what, 110 kids or so in grade one, we've been able to really see those kids. and the influence has spread more widely over grade two. And if, if you know the reading and recovery teachers, they are busy for every minute of the day, not just with their reading and recovery obligations, but right up through, uh, K f uh, through grade four. 
Um, and the next is sort of a question and I guess sort of a comment. Um, I hope the budget doesn't have to go lower, but there are also trade-offs even at this level. And I'm just curious, I, several questions that were emailed had to do with sort of maybe job sharing amongst administ administrative staff throughout the building. Could, is that something, or uh, just a comment, is that something that could buy you the increased health instruction if the, you had the, to go With there? the support staff? No, I don't know. Question, I think yeah. that was common throughout it, all the emails in terms of right. if there's job sharing that could be done between the middle school and the and Pond Cove or just sort of re looking at what the responsibilities are, are of those people from 7.30 in the morning till 3.30 in the I, I, I think it's worth investigating, particularly on, on the library side, since that's, that's affected both schools and we shared or did share an employee there. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions for Tom? Um, Tom, I, I still don't um, have quite a full picture on what the Allied Arts Teachers Days look like. You say they have four to five classes a day, so does that mean during the day that they have blocks of time where they could provide assistance in other areas of the building? Right. And uh, um, if they were fully booked, it would be f five periods a week, so three times they have only four. So they're asked to do other things. Um, which vary by their responsibility. So three times a week there's only four classes a day? Yeah. Okay, and so roughly when on, on those days... Three times in a six-day rotation, I mean, sorry. That's right. That's right. Next year, the numbers will break. I think that we can do a five-day rotation. Okay. Um, Which doesn't save money, but keeps people busier. Well, could possibly save money, perhaps. Um, the the permanent substitute that's uh, listed in the directory, the school directory, is that a full time equivalent employee, or is that just as an as needed basis? That's that's the person who we call on Tuesdays to do subbing so that the teams can meet. So that's a, so every Tuesday that person works full time. It, right. As a substitute, so the teams yep. can meet. And again, when, when I look at the schedule for next year, we might not need that because the number of teachers has dropped. And is that, we, so you may not need that, but that as of now, you still have it included. <laughs> I'm not that far. I don't think we'll need it next okay. year. Yeah. Next group of questions for Tom. Anybody else? Any other school board members? No? Okay. Thank you very much, Tom. And I guess we will move on to Steve. Do you want this? Well, I'll let you hold that one. All right. Okay. First off, Peter, I feel kind of badly you sitting back there, don't have room to spread out. There's, there's an extra seat up here if you'd like. All right, all right. <laughs> um, let's see here. Um, first of all, a as you have a copy of the narrative, so I know you've had a chance to look things over, and I do appreciate the opportunity to deal with some questions from people in advance. Uh, I have responded to some questions. I have uh, Karen's questions and Mary's questions, I think it is that I have not answered yet, so I'm still working on those. Um, the narrative and the rest of the budget, uh, as you can see, is, is in PDF form. It's online. Um, you may need a, a little while to read it. It's 147 pages, so um, let me know what you have for questions, whether you have your booklets in front of you or a laptop or something. The uh, budget narrative that I presented that John and I worked on starts, it gives a historical case uh, from 2005 to the present. And the reason that I did that was because I wanted to represent 
some comments that Nancy Hutton made several years ago in her last budget preparation was that the t pretty much the time of trimming has come for an e to an end at the middle school uh, and, and there is no uh, supply lines left that would make substantial differences in budgets and so forth. And so you can see in the narrative that for the past, this is my fourth budget cycle now, and in all four of those, we have lost positions. Um, I uh, want to let you know that we have uh, 576 students in the middle school right now. We're anticipating 572 for next year, so we're pretty much the same population. Uh, this 2% budget increase represents uh, almost $130,000 to the middle school. And John and I had a, a pretty large word up on the board, which was insulate. And that was our idea of trying to say, how, how can we keep these cuts that we're going to be doing uh, as far away from the students as possible so that it didn't in not impact classroom sizes any more than necessary. And uh, we've also been working very hard so that as we collect information from staff that this and community members, this doesn't become a value versus a devalue situation where people say, well, I don't know what this person does, so why don't you cut that job, or I don't know what happens here. It's, uh, this is a very difficult process to keep morale moving forward in any organization, but that's what we're working at. Um, just as a recap uh, of the, there's a synopsis in the narrative about what the budget cuts mean, and I'll just go over those very quickly. There's uh, the science and language arts lead teacher positions would be lost. They're currently working at two tenths of a position each of, of a period each day, uh, excuse me, of the day. So that means that they would each pick up an extra class, which is not that great a difference. But when you consider the work that I have some information for you on tonight in, in a handout, so that stretches my seven minutes, uh, you can read that at your leisure. Fifth and sixth grade accelerated language arts will not occur next year, and that's a combination class this year. And the reason being because uh, part of the cuts, three-tenths cut to, the, to a 7-8 language arts social studies teacher combined with the loss of the language arts lead teacher position means that there are extra classes that need to be covered, and I don't have the staffing to do that without um, taking a look at some of the classes that have slightly smaller numbers, like the accelerated class has. And so those students will be in regular the regular education classes. Um, executive functioning service that you find in the narrative as well. You find a, a page and a half that explains what that is. It's a service that Dom and I work out between us that we feel is, is absolutely what we consider a seamless service. Uh, it's not whether you're in special education or instructional support. It's not whether you're a regular education student. It's about the need to, ba to execute the basic functions of being a, a uh, productive student. Um, some of those will be... Um, we currently are servicing, for instance, in just the 7th and 8th grades, we're servicing 18 students. That number next year I think will be down to about 13 that I'll, we'll be able to serve. We still have the need to serve 18 or more. 5th um, and 6th grade, it says technology program, and I want to be clear with people that that means uh, that's like a shop tech program. There is an explanation that I sent out online in the email, and I have a write-up about it that also explains that some of the pieces that students are going to be missing in there would be mechanical advantage, uh, forces and energy, bridge engineering, design and construction, um, cost analyses, budgeting, wind energy technology with wind vehicles, and solar technology with solar cars. Those, those are examples. There is an EdTech 1 position that uh, it works uh, across the school. There are, are, there's a half-time ed tech one, that's a library ed tech position, so we'll be down to a half. There is a half-time, oh, thank you, educational technician position. That was quick. Uh, professional development will be down $7,000. There will be losses of co-curriculars, fifth, sixth grade, seventh, eighth grade math teams, anything that gets on a bus, speech and debate, outdoor programs that are not completely picked up by parents. Um, expansion teams will be cut. Jeff has had to, Jeff Thark has had to put that in. Um, no uh, textbook cycle again. This would be year 14. And I would say that as I looked through the uh, future directions plan and I also looked at the uh, national middle school position paper, this we believe that are guiding principles, we're not meeting some of those uh, ideas, these cuts. 
I feel we were struggling to meet some of those to begin with, and these cuts set us further back from that. Um, I, I know that it, this is a case of preaching to the choir, um, but this is the situation that we're in, so I don't have a great outlook for you today. I'd rather present something with ribbons and bows and so forth, but that's not going to happen. And my question that I would leave people with is, just as a reminder, this is about a 2% increase, uh, increase, which means $130,000 lost. And where are we going to end up? So this is where we're at now. Um, I'll hand out these packets and then take questions. Um, while Steve's passing those out, um, Steve, when you're finished, do you want to maybe talk about the answers that you had initially sent, uh, I think, out in reference to Rebecca's questions um, so that we have that for the whole group and all? About the uh, position cuts, one being the loss of, the, of an EdTech 1 position. That's one of those cuts that when you make that, people in homes and in the communi community can look at that and say, I didn't see any impact about that kind of a loss. That doesn't do anything. Actually, there's some information in here that would help you understand what that person does. And also about the loss of the uh, Tabitha. Eight, Tabitha Glanville is eight-tenths time, and it would be three-tenths of her day that would be cut out. And Jamie, um, if you don't know Jamie, come on over to the middle school and have a chat with her about where we're working to go in the language arts. She is very passionate, extremely dynamic, and is doing a great job leading a charge. Um, and I'd like you to hear from her. Um, next page talks about grade five and six technology. That's the shop tech. Next page is about library educational technician position. If you don't walk in these people's shoes, and I don't either, Sometimes it's difficult to say exactly what somebody does. These will give you clear ideas. There's also uh, the next page is about um, Sherry Gilley's position, the Ed Tech One at the middle school. You, you just look at simple things. This is where I, I have this. I don't know who it is because the person doesn't identify herself, but each of the last two years, I've had an elderly citizen contact me to let me know that she's a retired teacher, taught 30 years has been retired for some time, did not teach in the Cape schools, taught elsewhere, but has lived here. And I get the same questions about, I didn't have those kinds of positions. Nobody made photocopies for me. Nobody did these sorts of things. And I'm trying to say, it's a little bit different. You know, we've got a few different regulations. Did you have AEDs in your school? Did you have CPR training? Did you have kids with EpiPens? Were you helping to, dist uh, to do checks on students with diabetes? Were you covering for, did you have, when you left for a PET, who covered your class? Um, how was your power school portal? Who was maintaining that? Who was maintaining your electronic website, your homework calendar, your, I mean, that I've tried to convey that what teachers have in front of them on a daily basis is not the same as what a teacher had in front of him or her in 1975. Looks a little different. Um, the middle school educational technician three computer lab position. Now, if I combine that with the library, and, uh, those two pieces that are lost, it's going to be very difficult to maintain uh, the computer lab and library without having to shut it down periodically, um, depending on situations that are going to occur, occur. I envision that we won't have those open full time next year. Um, Kathy Clough is the person in that position, and she is also on the subsequent pages that in this packet, she has listed for the 2008 school year every time that she was requested to sub in a classroom. The last category says hours. Please scratch that. It should say minutes. And so she has a log here that represents a total of 204 hours that she subbed and that covered 126 times across the school. And if you figure an hourly rate of $12.50 an hour, that's over $25,000 that we saved by not hiring somebody outside like a, uh, a part-time substitute for a day. So, and it also gives you some of the pieces that she's involved in. 
Um, now the questions that I've already responded to. Um, one was about the technology classes, and you see that information here. With uh, There was a question about two technology teachers. Why does the EdTech 3 reduction have such a negative impact? Uh, in reality, it's not that we have two technology teachers. We have a Ka uh, Kathy Clough is an educational technician 3. She staffs the lab, and you can see the other job requirements there. Provides students and teachers with assistance, provides substitute coverage. Sally Tamaro, who is the office secretary, teaches one period, so she's two tenths uh, in the sixth grade for computer skills, keyboarding, electronic tools, so forth. Um, computer lab is connected to the library. There are times when Hayden Atwood, the librarian, is either teaching a library ed skills class, he may be teaching a fifth grade computer class. Uh, we have half-time library ed tech next year who will be scheduled to cover the, the between Kathy's time, half-time, and also covering classes, and between Charlotte Brewington, who will be uh, the other half of the library position next year, and Hayden and his class times, there are going to be periods that are going to just end up blackouts. I just won't have anybody to provide the coverage either. Hayden may be there, but he might be teaching a class, so we can't have kids checking out library books while Charlotte may be helping out to keep the computer lab open. That's a, a given example. Um, why is the impact only to fifth and sixth grades? Uh, you know, I can't cut, for instance, I can't take and say, if I need to reduce uh, a, a half a teaching position, I can't take and go, I'll take a piece like a tenth or something from the fourth, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh, and eighth grade and try to build it that way. Mm -hmm. I either have to offer the program to the whole allied art group or I don't offer it. So um, it, it was, I determined that the fifth and sixth grade would be the areas that I'd have to work at. Uh, seventh and eighth grade class students still can access the computer assisted drawing and design program, robotics software. Um, programming, uh, computer programming, uh, robotics programming, flight simulation, 2D, 3D, and virtual room construction, and tours as well as photo rendered imaging. So it was a toss up between the information that you see in your packet about the fifth and sixth grade or this in the seventh and eighth. This to me is beyond shop tech. This is technology uh, as most people envision it. And um, it talks about, it asks about preparedness for kids to utilize the laptops. It's going to involve the fifth and sixth grades because they're going to have less access to the um, computer lab and the sixth grade technology carts are being cannibalized now. We're down uh, seven computers that are from the original Milty um, block. So those are in their seventh year now and when they're gone, they're gone. We just don't, we don't have replacements for them. Um, EdTech ed 3 reductions, how does that impact substitute costs, as you can see in the uh, material that, uh, to me, it, it equates to about $25,000 worth of cost. Um, professional development and course reimbursement. As I looked at the future direction plan, goal two, the district will attract, re retain, develop, and supervise the best possible staff for Cape Elizabeth schools. Number five on that is extend and enhance collaborative professional development experiences and opportunities. Six is participate in professional development opportunities which support the professional growth of staff and the district's goals and objectives. I feel we're failing, falling short on that. Um, just by a given example, one of the cuts is $7,000 to the um, staff development lines for next year. And the last question that I had here in front of me, and then I'll see what other questions other people had. Um, stipended positions. This is about co-curricular. Does that mean the teams will be meeting less or the teachers will receive, uh, will receive less? It actually means that, um, and, and there were suggestions where people were thinking, what if you had those during the school day? Well, I'm not going to, Teachers who are stipend, let's take fifth and sixth grade math team. Um, could fifth and sixth grade math team be combined with seventh and eighth grade math team? Could it happen during the school day and then kids go to meets? Well, first of all, the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grades all have different, uh, there are two different lunch schedules and four different allied arts 
periods in different math classes. So no, they really couldn't meet collaboratively during a day. Also, uh, to me, that's that would be saying to it, I pretty much have to free a teacher up to do that uh, from teaching a section. I'd rather stipend a person. I think I'd rather have them teaching in the classroom. Um, also, the when we do the meets, the meets are by the Cumberland County. There are fifth and sixth grade meets, and there are seventh and eighth grade meets, and there are different locations. They're on different days. They're different venues. Um, there really is not a good overlap with that. That's just one example. Um, you know, we, we're doing pay to play with sports right now, and uh, to me, this is just an example of are we getting to the point of pay to think? So. It was either that in some of these cuts, or should I start eliminating some classroom positions and raise the numbers in the seats? Should I go back with the language arts teachers and say, let's go to five sections and we'll put your numbers up to 100 students or 105, 107 students per section versus the 85 students that you have on average right now, which is the national middle school projected uh, recommended number? And now we're... Uh, as I go around, I look at portfolios in general, not in every single case, but in general, I'm seeing much more writing. And when parents aren't seeing that, I want those parents to talk with me about it. I definitely want to hear and I want to look into this because there, that's, there are two emphases this year. It's we want more writing and we want more rigorous quality kinds of writing being done across the school. So I'm not going to impact the language arts and keep a math team. So what other questions do people have for me? Um, a couple of things. I struggle with, um, we need, we're supposed to be having a gifted and talented program. Yes. And I struggle with eliminating the ALA. Mm -hmm. We don't have a gifted and talented program even though we're supposed to have to, we're supposed to. I struggle with removing the ALA because, and I, this is not the first time that any of the principals have heard me say this. We move our strong math students, some of your middle school math students, come to the high school for classes. Mm -hmm. So we are able to challenge our talented math students. I personally think we do not provide the same type of challenge for our strong language arts students. I don't think there's lots of opportunities for them. So it really saddens me to see that this is leaving, um, particularly since we need to do it. Um, one of the other questions, the fifth and sixth grade technology, one of the questions you didn't answer. I, actually, even though that's not technology, some of the topics that are covered are sort of, we just saw a technology workshop. Those are the types of things the way, that make kids think the way they do. Is, can any of the information that was covered in, the, well, two questions, where do the kids go that would have gone to that technology class? Because I know that has to be built into your schedule. And two, is there any way that any of that information can be incorporated into any other class? Well, um, first of all, when we, we went, went through the science curriculum and matched it up to the, to the new parameters for essential instruction and we're just finishing up those priority learning goals for a presentation at the CIA the week after vacation, um, part of that was taken, to, taken into account was these elements are dealt with in the tech class. So uh, there is, there, we, we did have a, a uh, uh, compatibility there. Um, and secondly, the, the numbers um, mean that um, in the sixth grade next year, there'll be approximately 155 students. There will now be one less section for those students to go to in their six-day rotation. That's two, two times a week. That means that in just this one change, that means that the sixth grade allied arts cannot happen in one block now. It has to happen. For instance, let's say it's period three. It can't happen in period three. Now it's going to have to happen in two blocks, which means I've just lost common planning time for the entire sixth grade. Um, they will have no blocks in common for the, for the grade across at any point in time in the, in the regular week schedule. So every, and, and also the other allied sections, allied arts sections for the sixth grade, if I did not do that, they would be at 29 to 31 per section. And... You know, you can't have 62 kids in the gym. You can't have when when Sarah and Andy are inside, and you can't have you can't have 31 students in the in the art room while Marguerite's attempting to do metal smithing and a host of 
examples like that. So I realized that, uh, and, and John and I worked through these same pieces. We realized that each one of these things that we do right now has a cost. It's like the, the no free lunch idea. Or everything's connected to everything else. Um, the, there, there are going to be less teachers available uh, for um, some of those executive functioning pieces because they're not going to be there at lunch times. They, they need their common planning time. They'll have to find that at lunch. They need, uh, they'll be on more duties. Um, that there's going to be less availability for a teacher to pull them for an IEP during the school day. They're going to have to pull them after school. Less availability that way. So, so everything here that I've talked about, I feel, has a ramification uh, or some kind of impact, the domino effect. But any other decision that we have talked about, we felt had greater impact. The ALA in the fifth and sixth grade, um, in thinking about yet another unfunded mandate about gifted and talented, Absolutely. Another question we're going to have to, to grapple with is, all right, once these things actually come to fruition, now what? So we've tried to start wrapping our minds around that, but we don't have all the answers to those pieces. Uh, just one final comment. Uh, these, these so sadden me. When I compare, I appreciate all the work you've done. I mean, when we look at what's happened at the middle school in Pond Cove, I know that your cuts, Tom, have impacted students. The cuts you have, I mean, we're, our mission says we're developing citizens. So many kids are touched that don't maybe do well in the classroom, that do well in Chewankee or outdoor experiences. We've removed that. Speech and debate. Speech and communication is a life skill. I, I ad mentioned last night at another meeting, I think we ought to have a class on speech. I'm not telling you, you can't add another class. These are life skills that, that, that provide our kids with um, become productive and citizens, which is in our mission. These cuts, this is the first time, my five years on the board, all the cuts we've made before, I will say this is the first time that I, uh, this is gut-wrenching. This is the first time that I've seen cuts that, and this is with a 2% increase, that I think severely challenge our ability to do, to fulfill our mission, to make any progress, and this will impact every single student that walks into the door at the middle school. I absolutely agree with you. I think that the point that the middle school budget is at, to take $129,032 out, was not going to leave us with anything but these kinds of things. Whether it is in this category or in that category, it would have been just one, you know, one pocket or the other. And when, when um, we're, we're working very hard with people on the, on the National Middle School Association's um, uh, founding tenets, and as I look at those and I think about the, the fact that it clearly cites that students, student involvement in the life of the school is a major contributing factor to student school success. Self-identity, development of self. We just, we've just, you were just part of the same group with me on, on reading The Price of Privilege, thanks to uh, Gretchen Earl leading, leading the book group. And the, the, the big emphasis there was student adolescent development of the self. And these cuts that we're making are not helping those students to connect to the life of the school. Whether it's paying to play for a sport or going to community services maybe to uh, be part of a speech and debate team. Um, we're, we're pushing them away from the building and we're pushing them towards other avenues into making choices that we'd rather that they didn't have to do. Other questions for Steve? I guess along similar lines, um, you were talking about the sports, the pay to play, the movement, or it sounds like elimination of expansion teams. I know I have to take that up too with Jeff Thorick as well. Um, my concern there being, once again, what message we're sending to those kids, you know, the, the physical outlet, everything else, um, what kids we serve when we do that. I, I do think that's a tremendous loss. One thing I'm a little confused about um, is with the EdTech 3 position that was discussed. Mm -hmm. And you um, sort of showed us the accounting side of it, which was she was, I thought, saving us about $25,000 worth of right. sub costs. So how is that a savings? Y yes, that's what I'm asking. So how is that a savings? Um, two years ago, we didn't use Kathy Clough's position in that fashion. It was last year that John and I sat down and decided, look, we, we've got to try to do some other things. 
Uh, our sub-account money was looking as if it was going to finish in the, in the red. Uh, we had some uh, long-term subs that were in the building to cover for staff members who were on leave. So things were looking pretty <coughs> gloomy in that category. And so the decision that we made was, uh, well, John might cover a class, I might cover a class, or mm -hmm. as often as possible we'll have Kathy cover a class. And of course being an EdTech 3 means that she can deliver instruction um, with teacher supervision. That means that the lesson plans and so forth were pr provided for her. Um, the EdTech ones can cover a class, but they're not delivering instruction. And, the, and I don't have any EdTech 2s who, who are not connected to uh, instructional support, so I don't have them to, to call on. Um, her uh, eliminating part of her position doesn't help a couple of things. It doesn't help the computer lab and the use of the fifth and sixth grade technology. It, it means that the teachers are going to have to pick a lot of those pieces up. And there isn't somebody there to troubleshoot every time they turn around, which they need to do with me all the time. Um, they, they, they ask me not to touch any of the buttons in the computer lab. Uh, then the um, substitute piece is we're going to need to go back to staff and we're going to have to say, we got to get a little bit creative here, folks, because the answer isn't to shift this $25,000 back to that sub account. How are we going to cover these things? What agreements are we going to make? as a group because maybe I, I look at what Westbrook did where they the rest of the year they're not using substitutes and they cover it. If you have a free period, here's your name in a rotation and you're going to be subbing in that class when we the ones that we know about we can tell you in advance so you can plan around it. The ones we don't know about, I'm going to be looking down the hall saying, has anybody seen John Casey? And he's going to say, yeah, he's down in the he's down in the French class and I'm going to wish him luck. And the only thing I can say in French is bon chance. Um, so I, I know who's going to be covering those classes. Um, and just a comment on that, I, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering what you're doing to the productivity of the teachers by eating into planning time, you know, which I assume when you say free time, that that's being used for planning time. But um, but thank you for answering that. Um, I am still also a little unclear um, in the area of technology. One of the questions that I keep on wanting to ask, and I'm sure you can answer for me, and I think is sort of a fundamental skill that we would want to be developing. Um, and, and making sure that our students are proficient at, and that is just typing, learning how to use a keyboard, because if you don't have that skill, how can you, you do well with laptops and everything else? Could you just explain to me um, when they get that again, and if um, the technology piece has been eliminated in fifth and sixth grade is going to negatively impact that? That, that shop tech piece doesn't involve keyboarding. The computer classes that there's the shop tech and then there's the computer class that's also in the rotation. The students still go to that. As a matter of fact, just today, Sally Tamer and, our, and I were looking at uh, web tools for, um, the, there's a very interesting keyboarding program out there that it, it's not a freeware kind of thing. We've got some freeware, but they're very limited in their, in their opportunities to work with kids. Um, the, the programming that we were looking at allows us to tailor the work to each specific student. If somebody needs more work with the home row, they can stay right there. So, and, and there are plenty of examples that Sally Tamaro could talk about because she really got into it in great detail uh, just today. So they'll still be getting those keyboarding skills. The um, thing is, though, is maybe we should change the keyboard to something that just uses two thumbs. <laughs> They're all doing the uh, the text messaging and so forth now and. And as I watch kids, uh, even though they do go through a tech class, uh, excuse me, a computer class on keyboarding, the vast majority of kids that, well, I don't know vast majority, but definitely a large number of kids that I see are kind of in, uh, they've constructed their own uh, system. It's looking and typing and typing and looking and so forth and flying along, and they seem extremely proficient. So. Um, while maybe they're not doing pure typing skills like the programs are teaching, they, they don't let me touch the <laughs> I'll say to them, I'll take this note for you or something like, no, no, I haven't got time. So okay. they fly. I do, I, that would just be one thing I would probably want to explore a little bit more to make sure that we are developing those skills, um, you know, so that they really are proficient, mm -hmm. um, especially for wanting them to succeed um, with technology. And I guess getting back to that um, technology piece, um, and I'm, I'm going to ask each 
principal the same question, um, seeing that the school board has identified a goal of better integrating existing technology with curriculum and staff development, how is that reflected in your budget? I mean, all I'm seeing it's being reduced, and we've identified that as a goal, so how is that being addressed? In regard to technology yes. specifically? Okay, so, uh, we use um, a lot of our, uh, we, yeah, we use a lot of our staff meetings, I was going to say staff development, we use a lot of our staff meeting time. We have had options this year where teachers could go to breakout sessions to, um, to learn more about how to update websites, how to create links to the websites, how to, um, how to, what's the other one? Yeah, blogs and wikis Dean's been working on. Uh, Adam was doing the work with the websites, Adam Killip. We also just had a presentation on how to, electronic how, the electronic homework boards, updating that, the new uh, Giving Tree um, piece that's on there for donate, donating goods to the classrooms and how the teachers can access that through their first class. Uh, we had another technology example. So we use primarily our staff meeting times. And then we also have opportunities where uh, in the summer teachers have gone to the tech camps that Gary Lenoy has run. Gary, Gary Lenoy? No. Oh. Uh, Please so write down. Where? Oh, hi, Gary. The tech camps. And then teachers will also see the um, technology integrator, Dean Harris, to say, hey, this is what I'm thinking about, like in their physical education winter fitness website. How can we construct that to be a more useful tool? Dean works things out. I've just recently gone to him about using data, and he's constructed a very nice tool that I can go back in the NWEAs, for instance, and, and look. I can pick a specific class, and I can look spring to spring, which is the truest measure for me. As long as I get three springs in there, I'm in great shape. So there are, there are good opportunities for us to access so long as Gary's piece stays in place. And so long as I have the, the people in place who are the teachers who are willing to share, which, which is a great thing, people are really pushing that with each other. Um, are we sending people out to attend a lot of conference activities, to attend workshops, bring things back? No. When people say to me, uh, boy, you know, that smart board piece that's up in, in um, where was it? I think it was in Buxton recently up in Bonnie Eagle. Nope, couldn't send people to that because the budget at the time was frozen. Um, so there have been some opportunities. I get a lot of information back from uh, the Milty folks who, uh, uh, Juanita Dickinson, she's always sending me information on what's available for teachers. And I would say I've sent teachers to about 10% of that this year because I haven't had the funds to send them. Um, thank goodness Gary is involved in Actum, so we were able to send some people there because he could get us a deal. And just um, one last question, which is, um, and I think Trish asked this of Tom earlier, about sort of exploring some possibilities around job sharing amongst administrative support staff and things. Have um, have you looked at in, into any of that? Between schools? Between schools or within your own school? Um, if you look at, for instance, Sherry Gilley's notes on the EdTech One position, I think what you'll see is administratively there is in my view quite a bit of job sharing already going on cross training all over the place for people to be able to step in at any given time and to cover Julie Salikas to work uh, to do some of the jobs Kate Tebow might do Sally Tamaro Michelle Gagne so there's this cross training that way uh, to look beyond the school and to say uh, Jeff are you going to need some assistance or Tom are you going to need some assistance to be very honest with you I don't I think my support staff is stretched. Um, they, I, I have the staff I need to do the jobs. We can get them done this year. But I don't think I have the luxury of saying to somebody, well, let's see, you got a half an hour today. Why don't you see if you, you know, does Bon Cove need any assistance with this thing or with that thing? You just don't have it. Thank you, Steve. Yep, Rebecca. You'll have to share. share. Yeah. Well, I, I'm actually not sure. This is more of a general question because it kind of has come up both with Pond Cove and, and middle school. And I, I could really use some clarification on the differences between ed tech ones, twos, and threes, and what they can and cannot do, and their roles as substitutes. Um, I am under the impression that ed tech ones cannot be 
they are required to have supervision in the classrooms and so really cannot function as substitutes, but yet then I read on this that they do act as substitutes. So if you could help maybe clarify that for me. I think what I'm going to do, I, could, I can do that, but I think Dom is probably, we have just written job descriptions for all three of those that are on your website, and Dom has spent a lot of time with that. So I think he's the better person to give you the responses because they are significantly defined by special education law. Yeah, at, I have all the ed techs basically. So we, there's ed tech one, two, and three. Does not matter whether they're regular ed or special ed. Ed tech ones typically were Title I ed techs in other districts. Um, and typically they have most of the Title ones prior to like three years ago were grandfathered. You could have a um, high school education and be a Title I. Now they've changed that. You have to have at least two years for an ed tech one, two, and a three you need to have three years and above. Most of our threes and twos have beyond a bachelor's and some have master's and some are even going for half a doctorate. So um, they all expand down. So ones in a classroom have to be supervised um, as well as twos. Ed tech twos can, do, um, can be left alone at times, but they have to be still supervised by a teacher. Threes in the classroom or out of the classroom or um, at other times. So you have to really look at that. So, but they have to be supervised. So you can leave them alone, but they have to be supervised by another teacher. Well, it depends. The, the example that I would give is um, I had a, uh, we had a teacher in early January who uh, had a broken tooth, I think was the case and that person was going to be out uh, for the last two periods of the day. We didn't have anybody else to cover the class. Uh, if I could put the Ed Tech 3 in there, that person could continue what the teacher's plans were and help to deliver instruction. Um, the Ed Tech 1 is a person who can, go, who can uh, supervise students, not deliver instruction. So that, pers though, that person can go in and students can be assigned to a study hall if I need to or if it's just um, um, the directions are on the board from the teacher and you have the materials you need and that person just manages the behaviors in the classroom. Th that's true. That's true. Right. And remember, these Ed Tech 1, 2s, and 3s are in special education regulation and there's some red regular Ed Tech 1s. I don't know if that's really clear. If they're not, if they're in a regular classroom in EdTech 1, probably, and I can tell you, probably across the, straight, the state, they are by themselves and they're not supervised. But I'm just coming from special education, so. It's brief, too. It's brief, right. And threes can plan and be left alone and go in the community. So just to let you know that. And deliver instru instruction. Thank you. Okay, um, we'll move on then to Jeff Shedd, high school principal. Okay, um, so what I'm going to do is just, uh, I think I just have a few minutes of sort of big picture remarks, um, and then I've, I think, written down most, if not all, of the questions that people ask me, and I thought I would go through those and see what's left over at the end. Is that okay? All right. Um, the, the high school budget uh, at 2%, well, the high school budget um, actually calls for a total increase of 1.7% uh, for the district budget of, of two. Um, and there are some difficult decisions that are being made. Um, I don't want to be said, say that the sky is falling uh, cause, because it's not, but there are di difficult decisions and we have to go lower. The decisions will become especially difficult. Um, and there will be challenges to creativity. Um, and basically what it is, um, to put, the, put it in perspective, compared to what uh, it would take from a budgetary standpoint to maintain our current staffing and resources, um, our budget next year will be 3.5% 3 3 lower um, than, than what it would take. So there are some things that are going to be cut. We are, at the same time, experiencing a reduction in student population of 15 to 20 students is what's projected. Um, 
and actually we had a we had a decline from last year to this year as well and i think one of the things that's not well known or appreciated is that we have as the as student population has gone down the last couple of years from the peak a couple of years ago our staffing has gone down as well um, and the projection is at two percent it will continue to go down um, between last year and this year, um, if, if the board would just to adopt the proposal that I've made, um, I don't anticipate that it will be exactly what I've, but roughly, um, we will have had reductions in two study hall monitors that used to exist, reduction in science staffing, mass staffing, world language staffing, social studies staffing. If you count the fact that I'm, I'm not teaching this year as I did the last couple of years, reduction in social studies staff. Um, a reduction in executive skills position, which is a significant reduction um, away from, a significant step away from uh, one of the core positions in the Achievement Center from its inception. Um, there's a reduction in that. Uh, there is a reduction in some extracurricular positions, and there's a reduction in technology staffing. That's between last year going to this year and this year going to next year if you, if you adopt the word to, to adopt exactly what I've said. Um, the only real increases in those two years would be in the area of literacy support, um, which I feel strongly is serving an important role and needs to continue to exist. Um, and I will advocate strongly that it continues to exist next year and substance abuse as well. I did add uh, for this year a part-time substance abuse position, which I'm regretfully proposing we eliminate for next year. Um, so there have been reductions over the past, um, and there are projected to be reductions as well. And that's my, I, I, I wasn't even close to seven minutes, was it, Alan? I don't think. Okay, so let me go through the questions. Um, class size, one of you didn't, you di uh, didn't send me an email, but asked me uh, if you could have more detail of sort of the section by section um, uh, what we have for class sizes in the high school, and I'm glad to give that to you. I didn't make, I've made copies for all the board members and for Alan and Pauline, and can certainly be put on the website if, if folks want to access it on the website as well. I'll wait a second for that to get around, and, and then I just want to point out a couple of things about it. Okay, I, I by no means am I going to go through this entire thing. I did, I just did a, I did do a quick check um, of the numbers of classes that are currently in single digits um, and the numbers of classes that are 24 or higher. Um, and I think for the, I, I know that there are more classes at this point that have 24 or higher in the high school that are in the single digits. You will notice when you take the time to go through it that I think without exception. Uh, every one of the classes in the single digits is either a remedial class or it is an advanced class uh, for students who are seniors and we didn't we don't want to not have something for them in an area of their interest um, or it is a class which is just a sort of a fluke of scheduling there's a large there's a very small section and it's balanced out by a couple of small a couple of larger sections and that just is a, it is a fluke of scheduling. And for the first time, not a point of pride, I don't say it pridefully, but we did break through for the first time we have a class of 30 this year. Um, and that's our advanced placement government class. Um, it wasn't 30, we did a little creative scheduling with AP government. The first semester it was two different sections and the second semester we had to combine the two sections into a class of 30, uh, which is operating now. And um, so that is, oh, and the other thing I wanted to point out, because it always gets confused, and, but I didn't want to in any way be accused of doctoring the books. Um, so if you look at page seven here, <laughs> class size is very difficult to follow, and it can be so easily misconstrued construed by taking one or two things out of context. Similar to what Steve is talking about, because when he talks about the middle school schedule, my eyes glaze over because I don't understand it. <laughs> and similar to this. If you look at Jim Ray, um, you will see a number of classes that have one, two, three. What I want, and I, I think I have to do this every year when we talk about class sizes down to this degree of detail, the typical teaching load is that teachers teach five classes. What Jim does in order to 
um, maximize the flexibility of schedule and serve as many kids as want his services as he can as he teaches more than five periods a day. He teaches either six or seven, uh, depending, and he combines classes. So if you'll see that there's a class of boat building that has a couple, it's offered during the very same period when there's a woodworking class that has eight. So it really is a total of ten. So you have to be careful about looking at, at those numbers in particular. They are deceptive uh, because um, Jim is trying to keep his schedule as flexible as possible to um, work with as many kids as he can. And that's all I'm going to say about the class size things, unless as you go through there are some questions that are prompted. Um, technology, I know it's been a common theme. I guess I have some thoughts about it. Um, and one of the things that I would encourage the board to do, and I hear it just sort of around the table today, I hear there's a lot of talk about technology, and I think I am in support of it, but I do think some work needs to be done before we invest a lot of money in what we mean by technology is to define exactly what we mean and what, you know, for example, keyboarding. Um, Karen, I mean, I've, I think for years, ever since I've been here, I've, I have, talk to so many individual kids and say you need to take keyboarding. It, you, th there's nothing you can do that will be more beneficial to you and save more time in the long run to take a keyboarding class, which we offer in the high school. I think in the, I'm a pretty persuasive guy about some things, and I think in the eight years that I've been here, I don't think I've persuaded one kid um, to take keyboarding. They're not convinced that it's important. Um, so the question is, at what point do we force them if we, if we do that and where? And I'm not saying we shouldn't, because I do think it's a valuable skill. If you ask me what are the technology skills that I'm most concerned about, do all of our kids get? get? Um, I would have a top three, but I'm not sure they match anybody else's top three. Um, the top three in terms of student skills for me would be database, spreadsheet, and, and website development. Um, but I don't know if that's what we mean when we say technology. Um, and then the other areas of technology I think would be, I think there's some really exciting things out there about wikis and blogs, and I know just enough to be not even really dangerous um, about them. I think there's a lot of professional development that needs to be done in those areas, and I do, and I think Tom mentioned that originally, that I think professional development is, is a bang for the buck place to put our efforts. Uh, because one of the things that I know is that um, I, I attended, Gary invited me to attend an Actum conference, and I have to say that um, I attended a presenter the beginning of which I didn't like his presentation at all because it was about a very glitzy, what I perceived as a very glitzy use of technology for kids producing movies. And I think there's a role for kids producing movies, um, um, but I wouldn't personally invest my money there. But then he went into uh, an um, unbelievable explanation of how teachers in the school that he was the principal of are actually using all kinds of sophisticated um, technology things as essentially review tools for kids and posting notes or posting videos of the classes and that sort of thing um, that I think would be fabulous and I think it actually connects to some conversations that Tom and I have had over the years and I'm wondering if as it gets clearer what a what a bonanza special ed may be getting from the uh, <laughs> from the fiscal stimulus coming out of Washington DC whether there's some money that can be used for those kinds of things uh, to work on um, review things that can benefit all kids, but can certainly benefit, would be incredibly beneficial for instructional support. And I'm probably exaggerating the bonanza that you're going to be getting down because I, I don't know the nut. Okay, okay, I'm sure, okay. Um, the second area that I would suggest personally that we need to invest in is just real nuts and bolts maintenance of these machines that we have. Um, um, a couple of years ago, I actually sacrificed an ed tech position in order to allow an addition of a position in technology. I don't have positions that I can put on the table and just say, take that. And, but Gary's crew needs to be expanded. One of the major impediments for teachers not using technology as much as they could is because they're not confident. And it's not a criticism of Gary's crew. They work as hard as anybody. They're the best technology crew, certainly, that I've ever worked with. So I don't want to be misperceived. But one of the best, one of the strongest impediments for teachers to take it as far as they can is that there's not enough support that teachers feel confident that it's going to work every time they, they bring it into the classroom. And that's just a reality because there's too many machines and not enough people to support them. Um, so I guess that my big picture on technology response is I think we've got to sit down and do some real planning and decide what do we mean by that so we can target what we think is most important. Um, <clears throat> I, there were a number of questions that related to um, 
secretaries, they were connected with um, efficiencies due to technology and as um, secretaries have gotten more productive because of technology, um, is there a way to cut them back? And I guess I wanted to add this perspective. Number one, um, um, since I've been at the high school, our population has gone up from 500 to 600, and it's now back down to about 560 or so. When it went up from 500 to 600, we did not increase the secretarial staff. And at this point, I'm not proposing that we decrease it as we go down to 560, which is higher than it was where I, when I came. Um, there are some efficiencies, and there's, there is definitely increased productivity, which, inc which comes with technology. But the other piece that we all know is that there is increased demands and increased expectations that come on to people. Um, in terms of we, our t secretaries can do a lot more. We could we put in a lot more data so that we can get more, sp we spit more in so we can spit more out and that sort of thing. And parents' expectations of us um, increase um, as our abilities with technology increase and that sort of thing. So I, I, I don't want it to be a thought that there there, because we've got technology that there is less to do. In fact, I think there's different things to do um, and there are different expectations. But um, having said that, if, this, if in my view, in terms of where I would set the priorities, if the budget has to go significantly lower, that's definitely an area that we need to talk about. Troy and I have had multiple discussions about exactly this topic. Um, so that's sort of technology. Um, somebody men asked about e-books, electronic books, as opposed to text textbooks. Um, and I read an article about that just a week or so ago. And publishers are not really my take on it. And it's another area that I think we need to take a look at. I think it's part of the whole technology big picture. But e-books have not really taken off particularly well. Um, and I think we really need to look at the pluses and minuses of that. You know, one of the things that I was I was reading, I Googled a thing about ebooks, and there was ended up in a discussion group. Um, and one of the things that a professor was commenting to the person who had written an article about ebooks is, has anybody considered the fact that typically what kids do when they get ebooks, at least at the college level, is they press a button and print everything out. Um, so, which is often paper that they produce at the college library or they would do it here at the high school library and that sort of stuff because it's not a really particularly friendly way to read a textbook online. So I think that's got to be something that gets considered. I think it's intriguing. I think maybe it's in the future. Um, I'm not aware of the high school any things that are really all that cost effective as far as ebooks go right now. Um, the guidance department, have we thought about cuts there? Um, we, it's something that you know, it certainly has been considered. It wasn't a surprise when it came up at all. Um, my answer to that is the way I look at the guidance office right now is we do have, um, uh, compared to some other schools, we do have a favorable student student counselor ratio, which is why I propose, in light of the fact that I'm proposing that we eliminate the executive skills position to begin to use the counselors as part of a core group of people who can really support kids in executive skills, which I think makes an awful lot of sense given what a guidance counselor's position is and I've started to have a conversation with the guidance counselors about that. Um, so that that would be my sense about that. And I have already begun to ask the guidance counselors to begin to do some things differently. Recently the guidance counselors have been, I asked the guidance counselors um, to begin because I think that parents oftentimes do not know when their kids meet with guidance counselors because kids don't normally go home and say, gee, I saw my guidance counselor today. Uh, particularly a ninth grader or a tenth grader. So I've asked the guidance counselors and they've started to do it to write e brief emails to parents. Did you get one today? <laughs> brief emails to, I didn't plan, I didn't plan that, Karen. <laughs> it's well timed, but I didn't. <laughs> just brief emails to parents to say, because it may prompt a conversation at home about something. Um, and those are important conversations to have and I think that that's useful. And you'll also see in the next few weeks, the counselors are planning a short survey to send out to all the parents. Of, of, se of seniors, and I, I think it's seniors we're planning to do, sort of looking back on their four years, and we're going to be starting to do that every year about how are we doing compared to your expectations and how can we do better as you look back on the needs you had and that sort of thing. Um, there was a question about department chair stipends. Can I, can I combine some department chair positions? Um, and that is something that I have considered. It's not a step that I've taken at this level of the budget. It's uh, something that I would need to consider more seriously if we have to go lower. Somebody asked about the research coordinator position and what is that? That is really the librarian. Um, and in most 
schools. The librarian handles actually one of the larger budgets in the school. And in our school, I think one of the real strengths of our librarian is she works really closely with teachers in each of the discipline areas, which, which takes a lot of time outside the regular school day to coordinate with department chairs, to meet with individual teachers, to say, what do you need so that the library can be as supportive to your needs as possible? And she also manages and coordinates a budget that is one of the, it's not the largest, but it's one of the largest in the school. So it's not unusual. Um, so, but the title of it, for some reason, is research coordinator here. She also does produce every year. She oversees the production of a research booklet, uh, which a lot of time and effort has gone into. And I know a lot of time and effort gonna go, is going into it this year as well to revise that. Um, somebody asked about theater. Um, is, there, is it possible to make it self, more self-sufficient? Um, and also, how many students does it serve? I didn't ask Dick specifically. I didn't get to him today. But it's in the neighborhood of 100 to 150 students outside the class setting. Depending on what the mix of productions is in any given year, in a musical year, it's easily 100 to 150, if not more. In fact, Dick would probably correct me and say that it's more who are involved. Um, is it possible to make it more self-sufficient? It would if there was a, a boosters organization, which there could be. Dick, frankly, has always avoided having a parent booster organization uh, for some, I think, because boosters organizations come with some pluses and some minuses, particularly when you're talking about who's going to get the lead role of this and that and the other thing. Um, is that different from athletics? No. Could it happen? Yes. Um, it's a good question. Um, but it serves an awful lot of kids. Um, the stipends are a lot. They have actually redu been reduced in the not, I think, two or three years ago, I reduced one of the positions pretty substantially. Um, and I actually had proposed at one time an even more drastic reduction, and and there was some pushback against that, and it was legitimate pushback, and that, got re that decision got reversed. Um, executive skills, um, this is the one that I think there's the most concern about, and I don't like putting it on the table as something to cut. Um, but I, I tried to answer in my narrative sort of my thinking about that, and it is the case that although there's a tremendous amount of science and brain research that goes into understanding how the brain works, which explains what you do to help students with executive skills, a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff about supporting executive students who have deficiencies in executive skills can be done by people who don't have that specialized degree of knowledge. Um, it's, there are some coaching models out there that are very effective, that are very well documented, that I think we can use guidance counselors and others in some different ways to provide some of those services. And I think a big part of what we need to do better as a staff, as I say in my narrative, is to begin to use the PowerSchool portal and the teacher websites more systematically and, and, um, and uniformly so that, so that um, parents are aware of what the, expect, what the needs are, what the assignments are, and that sort of thing. A lot of our teachers do a very good job, but not all of our teachers do as good a job as others. And that means I need to do a better job of sort of pushing teachers in that direction. Um, there are the questions about Latin 1. Um, my suggestion to cut one section of Latin, not to cut Latin, but to cut one section of Latin. Um, and I knew when I put this on there that it was going to be as controversial this year as it is every year when it's been put on. I do want to say that it is different this year than last year than it has been in any previous year because if you remember the lengthy discussion, we dropped for this school year, we dropped the requirements that students take either French or Spanish concurrently with Latin. So this is the first year that students have not had to take either French or Spanish concurrently. The reduction, the result of that was it made absolutely no difference. Um, we still didn't have enough kids to sign up to take Latin II um, to be able to justify Latin II. If we did, then this proposal wouldn't have been on the table, but we didn't have enough to do it. Um, and we've only had, I think, in all the years that I've been here, we've only had once a Latin II class that's actually had enough kids signed up to off offer it. And it was interesting that when I had to make the decision to cut, not to offer Latin II, but instead to do two sections of one, um, there were only seven or eight kids who were signed up to take Latin II, which is clearly not enough to justify it. And then when the teacher generously offered to create the class in the morning, a couple of more kids signed up to take it as well. So I think now he's got 10 kids coming at 7 o'clock in the morning a couple days a week, and the parents pay him privately. Can I guarantee that's going to continue to exist? I can't, because he does. I can't require him to do that. Um, um, but kids want to take Latin. 
but when they have to make decisions about Latin or something else on their schedule, not enough make the decision to take Latin to just to justify it economically, in my view. Um, uh, field trip, co-curricular. I have not proposed redu eliminating any any extracurricular positions in my, in the budget. The approach that I've taken is to reduce the expenses for field trips and reduce some of the expenses for supplies for different groups with the hope that, um, frankly, parents and families would pick up some more of the costs or kids would get involved more in fundraising. Um, and I think that that's, in most cases, a, re a realistic hope. Is it right from a ph philosophical perspective? I'm not going to defend it on a philosophical perspective, but I think, as a practical matter, the activities will exist for students. Um, uh, uh, one person asked about can we can we do fees for parking to raise some money and I just want to let you know we do kids are charged to park we could raise the fees um, and Troy and I have talked about raising the fees for parking I think right now it's with it twenty five dollars for twenty dollars and that gets them off all two and a half years whatever it is when they get their cars we could increase that uh, we get significant pushback from both parents and kids about the fee for parking. In fact, I get far more I get far more push pushback about fees for parking than we ever got about athletic fees. I'll tell you, <laughs> far, far more. Um, <coughs> um, <laughs> okay. Um, then there was a question about declining population and. But the staff isn't declining, but in fact it is, and I just want to make sure that people are aware of that, that it has declined. Um, have we talked to, to, I, to other surrounding schools about sharing services? And I have not yet done that this year. I will do that. I can't remember who the person was who asked the question, but it was somebody who was aware that the major impediment to doing that is different schedules in different schools. Um, South Portland has a block schedule. I think it's an every other day block schedule. Um, we have a very different schedule. I frankly don't like theirs. They probably don't like mine. I don't think theirs is educationally sound. They probably don't think mine is educationally sound. Um, it is the politics of scheduling, and it is a vast impediment. Um, and Scarborough has something which is completely different from uh, from either of us. Um, it's a real problem. And you know, if schools, obvious, and I think it's going to be faced, if at all, when schools actually physically consolidate. Um, or required because they become part of a common school district. Not that I want that, um, but I think that's the solution. But it's it's real hard. Um, administrators teaching classes. I um, about that possibility. I want you to know I did teach class the last two years, um, and that's why I got so darn far. <laughs> and Ellen knows, got so far behind on my teacher evaluation. I love teaching. I would l do it every single year. Uh, but what I what it, the cost that I paid was, and the cost the school district paid, has got way behind in my evaluation supervision because all the preparation and grading and that sort of stuff gets done at night, um, and I'm glad to do the work. It's not, but there's only so many hours in a 24-hour day. <laughs> to say nothing of a work day, but a 24-hour day. Um, I'm glad to do it. I love it. I I, I want to see Troy in classroom. I know he he came into my classroom last year, and the kids were amazed. Because uh, he taught in my class about economics during the Great Depression and did a fabulous job. And I think it's great for kids to see us in a different role. At some point, I will do it again. Uh, but I need to catch up on some other things right now before I tackle that again. So those are the questions that I wrote down. I probably missed some, or there are probably some others that have occurred. Thank you, Jeff. Questions for Jeff? Uh, Jeff, you talked about Latin, and I hate to belabor the point, um, but you are so far removed from my world still at this point that, <laughs> uh, so I, what I hear is lots of, um, you know, street talk about Latin. Um, and one of the things that I've been told is that one of the reasons why kids don't choose Latin is because it runs up against some very popular courses, other courses like band. And so they're faced with making a choice between two very good um, so selections. And so I guess my question is, is there a way to offer, so don't shake your head like you already know. <laughs> well, well, I understand, but I'm just wondering, given the passion around Latin, in the passion around band, 
Is there a way to offer band and Latin at different times of the day so, or these really popular courses so they don't compete against each other? I, I, I'll say two, two things in response to that. And one, I, one, one will be misconstrued, but I'll just risk it because it's true, that um, the people who feel passionately about Latin feel, pe people feel more passionately about Latin than just about anything in the world except band. Um, but if I describe it as one of the more popular courses in the high school, I mean, numerically, it's not one of the more popular courses at the high school because there's not too many kids who sign up to take it in any given year. And that's just the reality. But let me give you a, so that's the part that can be misconstrued. I like Latin. If we had, if we could offer five sections of Latin, I would be glad. To be honest with you, before I spent money in more sections of Latin, I would add Mandarin. Um, and I actually had it in an earlier iteration of my budget and thought better of putting in a section of Mandarin. But I would do that before I personally, as much as I think Latin is a great course, would add, would add another section of Latin. But that's a, probably a non-issue at this point. The bigger picture is you need to understand the way the schedule gets fixed. Uh, because that's what you're really getting at. It's a perfectly legitimate question. And one of the real strengths of power school is w I do not hand schedule the school. What we do is we enter in ki all the kids' requests for all the classes, band, Latin, a um, whole bunch of different things. Um, and then what we do is we essentially push a button and power school using its brain which is a lot bigger than mine to be able to deal with all the possible permutations spits a schedule out that meets meets the requests of the greatest number of kids um, and so there is no value judgment that is being made about latin versus other things um, there are some classes which are given a little bit higher priority um, the classic cases, well that's not true, I was going to say science lab classes, but that's not the case because we didn't do that. Um, there are some AP singleton classes which are given a really high priority because those are usually, especially the ones that are offered to seniors, um, so they're given a slight priority in the scheduling process, uh, but for the most part what governs it is the computer program does the best that it possibly can to meet the greatest numbers of requests that kids have made. Okay. Any other questions for backfill any of the things we're cutting at the middle school with some collaboration between the high school and the middle school? No comment. <laughs> yes. You do ha they've got a rotating schedule. And ours is a fixed schedule. So that would be the only common block that we have right now is you have a, is this the first period block A or something that stays put. Yep. See, you said you go glassy-eyed when you talk about mine. See, I got a piece of yours. All right. So or when I talk about yours. Okay. So uh, A stays put because we've got the common math. And then hmm? one day. One day. One, one day right. Um, other than that, we don't have any times in common. Uh, we, ha we used to have cases in which we shared a math teacher with the middle, between the middle school and the high school, but that's been, John, what, uh, 15 years, 18 years? No. Uh, Charlotte. 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 Yeah. Oh. No, I've been, uh, okay. Don't, stop, stop. I mean, it is an interesting question. Or Steve and I can talk about it. Um, you know, we I, I, and we haven't talked about it yet. So I think it's an interesting one. The, ske the schedule issue would be the one that we would have to solve if we can solve it. Um, and if there are some kids, you know, yeah. Steve, we, I mean, in particular, I thought it was you know maybe 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 Steve can probably answer this, but I think that we probably I think we probably. There were some kids, the kids sort of on the fringes perhaps, that we lost when we cut woodworking. Yeah. And we have some of that still at the high school, and that is important for those students that we service. And uh, just wondering if 
we have the resource in our community, and I understand the scheduling challenges, but that might be something that we can sort of service those kids that we are not going to service by cutting off these sort of non-traditional programs. I don't mean to interrupt, but we're running a tiny bit late, and we need to move on to Dom. Is, are people okay with their kids? Thank you very much, Jeff. Okay, we'll move on to Dom DePatsy, instructional support. I'm just going to pass these out. These are um, like acronyms because I'm going to speak in a different language because I've got seven minutes. So I'm going to move pretty quickly through my um, through my information. So I'm going to quickly go through um, on page one. I just want again. I put down the number of special ed students that we have we're, we're maintaining even though the population is dropping we're you know right at 180 this was the December child count in in that time it's already gone up several I think we're up six more students this week we we uh, get two high school students one uh, I'm not gonna tell you both coming from different districts both with needs so um, we're they come and go all the time students do. So 504, that is another, um, I wouldn't call it an unfunded mandate, it's a federal mandate, but that is going up due to new rules, I'm not going to go into that. Um, just on the side, the commissioner will publish a report on unfunded mandates next week, so that will be out for some of the um, other types of information. I know a lot of you have interest in unfunded mandates. Um, on page two, uh, this is just talking about the disabilities of the 180 students, and I think it's real important to note that um, if you look at autism, we have, it says 19, but that's not all the children that we have on the spectrum. We actually have 28 students ranging from severe um, nonverbal autism all the way up to the savant range. Um, so high Asperger's type of students. So it's 28 students. Those kids are not all in special ed. They could be in 504 and they could be on a personalized learning plan. So that's the students that we have thus far. Um, another thing I just want you to note because I think this comes up in asking about caseloads, please note multiple disabilities. Look at 20, it, last year was 23, it's 27. That means these students have multiple disabilities. So they have significant needs <clears throat> and need more self-contained type of programs. Um, another interesting fact that I didn't really talk to Tom about was the uh, specific learning disabilities. I thought that would go down. That is actually going up even with new regs. Um, really pushing processing disorders. Um, other areas that have gone down, I think, were ED and other health impairment. That's because of the Cumberland County put out a report, um, a form that we use to see if kids qualify. On page three, staffing concerns. I'm going to kind of address that with caseloads, but those are the staffing concerns um, over the last several years. Again, you know, I'm keeping all the same staff at this point. On page four, I just part, again, Instructional support includes special education, 504. Um, parts of RTI, because of our instructional strategists, do a lot of work with each of the student study teams, as well as doing personalized learning plans, um, helping out with consultation. Uh, so I, what I wanted to put down there is how, we, how I'm kind of gauging how if RTI is actually working in the district. If you look at 2006, 2007, we had 64 referrals to special ed. Uh, 2007, 2008, it dropped to 38, almost in half. So I think we're doing something right. We're not perfect, but we are working on it. Um, and I think the DLT team is really working collaboratively um, to do that. This year we have 19. I don't know where that's going to go. I, it could stay. I think it'll be a little bit less. Um, on page five, again, a lot of the referrals this year are not coming from the, the, I think the SST teams are really working hard to keep kids in tier one and tier two. Um, again, these are parent referrals, and we do have some staff that like to say to parents, um, please go and make a referral. So I'm trying to decipher which one of those is staff-induced or real parent-induced. I'm not going to go over the numbers of um, on page five because um, I messed it up. I need a calculator, and Pauline kind of noted that, so just I'm going to ignore that. Again, another indication of... Um, RTI working is the number of evaluations that have been done in special ed that's including referrals. But we did 96 in 07, last, um, 06, 07, last, uh, 2000, 2007, 2008 was 78. And this year we're at 43, so we're kind of doing well with that. Um, on page six are, is basically my cut for the uh, 2%, and what we are doing is uh, bringing my one out of district placement back into the district, into the middle school. Um, that's a savings of actually $100,000. Um, 
12,000 I'm putting kind of on reserve just in case we have to go further cutting. So, um, and, st and Jeff and I are fighting over the savings of a riff that we have. So, um, I'm, I'm taking it and we're going to have to fight over it. Um, Medicaid, I think another important thing is, um, I know Alan gave a figure. I, my, I had 177,000 um, last year that we pulled in. He said 154. I'm not quite sure. I mean, 09, 010, so I'm not quite sure where that is. But we, I think the Medicaid increase comes from we only build, uh, when I first came here, we only build for SBRS, which is school-based rehab services, which are related services, OT, PT, speech and language. Now we also bill for day treatment. These are your choices programs that I've shown most of you. We have three of them and the life skills programs that and we have three of those. Those we bill and I'm going to get into a question later on of how there was a question of how much it costs per student. I'll, I'm going to do that afterwards because I need my seven minutes and I'm almost done. Um, the last thing on page seven are caseloads and I'm going to wait till after because I'm going to answer those questions about caseloads and I just want you to you know, go, go down through but they range from early to you know 20s to at the high school there was I think this year but we'll go up there's um, 16 and 17 um, but I'm gonna go into that too as we go through um, so that's my report on that I know I'm gonna can I answer questions now yes can I ask um, just one before you start that yep. um, for people who may not be aware mm -hmm. can you give I know it's not brief can you give a brief description of what RTI is because it's a newer type of thing and I, I think some folks don't it, understand what that is. Cor correct. R RTI is response to intervention in the regs in Maine. It's actually called the pre-referral process which is a very bad name because it really should be response to intervention. It's a federal law that came from no parts of No Child Left Behind and what they did was the federal government they kind of pushed it in to IDEIA, which is, which I'll talk about in a minute, which is the special education regulations. So they, they kind of pushed it on to, to kind of formulate it with special ed, when it's really a regular education initiative. Um, I think in CAPE, what we did, we're really kind of working together in a seamless process, um, where basically what we have to do in a nutshell, it's a, it's a three-page law in our special education regulations, but it's a regular ed law, it's confusing three components to it. You have to develop student study teams, which we have, and I think we've successfully done that. So we've done that. The other part is curriculum-based measurements, which, is, which are done in Maine, of course, had to go beyond what the federal um, requirements were, and the research really is K-3, to but they went K-12. to And it's really for really reading and not reading math and behavior. So Maine added a lot of other, that's the unfunded mandate for Maine. Really, a strict RTI is really for reading and for specific learning disabilities and trying to get at that earlier on. I hope that kind of, it's, it's yeah. more complicated than that, but I'm just trying to make it in a nutshell. I realize, but I know other people ha who haven't ev even you know, brushed up against that might have yep. no understanding. And the other thing is um, day treatment. A mm -hmm. few years ago, we didn't have day treatment, and now Correct. you do. Um, and I remember that um, placing students out of district was extremely expensive, and I think you've demonstrated that here where you have an out-of-district placement that's coming back to us, mm -hmm. and that was costing us $88,000. Is that correct? Correct. And so that, that student will now be with us here, mm -hmm. and we won't be paying that $88,000. Um, I'm sure that there's a cost associated. You may or may not know that, but um, if you could just briefly again talk about how we didn't have day treatment and now we do and how that is affected. Right. And I think as I went over the numbers of students with multiple disabilities, I think in the last three years that I've came here, I think the, the we have students that have a lot of needs. And I sat in Augusta today with other directors and on rep board and we're all facing the same thing. Like for example in Gray, they have no children on the autism spectrum. We have 28. So it varies from the pockets and its culture, its genetics it's all over the place so the day treatment programs are put into place really you've got to have them if you want to keep kids in your community and not do out of district placements if we did not have these programs and we had only resource room programs um, like we did have and I was watching kids with behavioral disorders um, running around a resource room where resource room teachers are trying to teach reading and math they can't they can't do it 
So if we didn't have it, and um, and again, I have we're put on notice by four I'm not four parents for out of district placements. They put me on notice, so they could take us to due process at any time, and they're mostly linked to these type of programs. So I just want to make sure that's clear. And the reason, and they're and they're at capacity. I mean, the high school just gained I think two more students, so they're at she's at ten in our choices program, and it fluctuates all the time. So, thank you. Do you want to cover the questions now? Okay, <clears throat> so let's go over caseloads. So I'm just going to read. I polled all the Cumberland County directors, um, and I got pr a lot of them. Some of them didn't. So in South Portland, P you guys want to know caseloads. I think we are actually higher than most of the area. In South Portland, um, let's see. I'm sorry. i got to go up here a little bit. Uh, caseloads range from six in the self-contained to 23 resource room students. Kim Hugel at the middle school has 27 students in her classroom. And if you watch her, and, and, and she's pregnant, by the way, go in there and observe her, watch, and she's doing probably seven to eight different programs a day. And it's not just one program she's teaching, and then they all go out. It's all different needs. Um, so that was South Portland. Scarborough. Um, Basically, and they, these are estimations, um, three in the resource rooms, low 20s, nothing higher. Um, K, to new, K to 2 numbers are smaller. Uh, and self-contained programs, they're 90 to 100 percent uh, filled. So it's 13 students, so 90 percent. So they're almost right where we are at this point as well. Gorham, um, <clears throat> they have around resource numbers around 20, again, lower than ours. And their FLS and behavior programs are around 12 each. They're, again, they don't have the averages. They just did that. Um, Portland. Portland, K to 12 resource room caseloads, 12 to 29. So it varies. Probably 29s at a high school, I'm assuming. So, uh, and FLS behaviors, 8 between 8 and 13. And Falmouth, I don't understand her spreadsheet that she gave me, but they're really low. 13, I think behavior 7, functional life skills 5, resource 13. That's at the K-2 to two school. Um, at the 3 to 4 is 16 resource, 18 resource. Uh, functional life skills middle school 7, resource room 10, uh, resource room uh, 26 on that one, 15, it varies, 19, 20, High school, 18, 21. So we're right in the ballpark, and actually I think we're a little bit over in some places. So you can compare those to our numbers, and I'll try to put this in a grid. I just haven't had time. I just got these emails all in the last 24 hours. Karen. Um, when I asked you the question about caseload, I was um, simply basing it on what you'd stated in the narrative about the maximum caseload for a resource room being 35 and for a self-contained classroom yep. being 13. And it sounds as though you're right where you need to be, well, a little bit less and actually significantly less for the resource room. And you're showing me the comparison. So it yep. sounds as though perhaps these are, you would say, inflated numbers that this is not a, a good recommendation to use. I, I don't know who I, drove these maximum caseloads. Those, those are in our from? regulations. Okay. So 35, I can't even imagine a resource. If they had a resource room teacher had 35 kids, there would be no um, growth okay. whatsoever. Okay. 27 with Kim Hugel is pushing it. And the only reason she's doing it because she's excellent. Okay, and that so and that would answer that, that question. Yep. Thank you. Can you just add to that though? Yep. Your definition of special ed, what, uh, what is what is the purpose of special ed? Special ed, in a nutshell, you have to have a disability in one of those thirteen categories. You have to, it has to adversely impact them in the general curriculum. And really, the whole purpose of special ed is remediation. Um, and a lot of our teachers, I get into, I, I go to a lot of IEP meetings, um, I have the luxury of that, and a lot of teachers feel, you know, it's a, well, no, you just need to help them with their homework. You need to help them, you know, with the skills. Special ed was not designed for that. It's designed as remediation. Get them in, remediate the skill, get them back out. I think the pendulum switched so far over to special education to, will take everybody, and I think regular teachers have are going to have to do a little bit more. And I, Jeff, one of the things Jeff left out, which I, I think it's important that executive functioning skills should be taught by all regular ed teachers, their, their skill deficit. If it's a skill deficit, then we might need to do some professional development with regular ed teachers to say, okay, what is the skill deficit? You have memory issues? Okay, this is a strategy to use, not for a special ed teacher to do that or an executive functioning teacher. So I think we can, it's not just organization. It's actually different skill sets, so. 
Yep. Other questions? Um, Trish? I think there was one question, and I know I've asked you in the past, and I won't put you on the spot if you could want to get back to us, but I know that last year you were able to give us an estimate yep. of what special ed costs are not reimbursed. I thought it was like 25 to 30 percent. Okay. Um, let me figure this out. Okay. For, well, f this is only based on 180 students, so I kind of went to Pauline and I tried to figure out what it would cost. I think that was another question from one of you guys. How much does it cost per student? And um, it's hard. It doesn't doesn't take into effect the 20, you know, the 504 students, the ELL students, the gifted and talented students. Where instruct, you know, all these different types of so staff certain. are all. It's hard <laughs> to calculate because the staff all we all pull together to do things, um, or even the RTI. I mean, it's different at different schools. Um, but what I what I did was, you know, I have a two million four hundred ninety two thousand dollar budget. Right. right. We get. On top of that, I have a budget of 353000 for fe it's federal money. This is the federal money that is right. promised by the Congress, okay? We get that. That's pr all my contract people. PT, I've got speech and language, social workers, psychologists, my two staff at the, at the, um, the central office. You add that in there, so it's $2.8 million, yeah. kind of. Yeah. Not talking about the stimulus. I'll go into that in yeah. a minute. So what we figured out was it's about fifteen thousand eight hundred six dollars per per special ed student based on that. But I don't know if I should back out, Pauline. I forgot to ask you this: the six thousand dollars for you know all students. Do you know what I'm saying? Every student's given a six thousand dollars. I don't know whether I should back that out or not. But but even beyond that, right? Which is interesting. How much of I know out of the two point eight you're getting three hundred thousand. How much of the remaining two point five? is actually reimbursed by federal and state who instituted the legislation yep. and then the difference but obviously falls to the local taxpayer. Right. The federal is the 353 and, I'll, and the stimulus I'll go over in a minute. I think in the EPS formula I think it's a 300, it's not a lot. It's what 300,000 that we get through EPS? It's not a lot. So, I, mean, I, I would say it's $2 million taxpayer money. So the vast majority of the special ed, even though it's federal and state legislation, is not reimbursed by the federal and state government, but is borne by the local taxpayer? Most of it, yes. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify yep. that. Yep. So, good. You answered that question. That was great. So, yep. Keep, you want to do a follow-up? comment around that. I think that's really good information to get out to the general public to see, you know, how much is not funded and the significantly mm -hmm. higher rate at, of, of cost per student for, the, you know, this is not at all in any way intended to be discriminatory towards special ed students, but to see how that is, um, how the taxpayers pay for that. And, uh, yep. and, and it's mandated. We don't have much choice about how we, how we serve them. Yep. And again, we are a shop. We are shopped as a district, as is Yarmouth and Falmouth. So I would talk to the other directors, and we get similar phone calls. We definitely shopped our CDS population coming in, which is the highest I think we've ever had. I, I we were shopped. So it's very interesting. So we're, I mean, I have a lot of a lot of students coming in through CDS. Uh, there was another one more question oh, about complaints and hearings. Um, a lot of um, most of those districts. Um, Gorham is going through uh, one hearing. They've put on, been put on notice three times this year. Portland's had, she said that she's had the most um, due process action she's ever had. Yarmouth refused to give me any information. Um, Falmouth didn't give me any information. And Scarborough said that they've had a few complaints and mediations. But we've all been put on notice by parents that they will take us to due process for unilateral placement to private schools. Right, you just, can you just, can just add to that? I would yeah. just like to get that cleared up. Will you add to that? How much does that cost us when that happens for legal fees, et cetera? Um, well, when that happens, we have to, it's a whole process we have to do. We have to, you know, document, have IEPs. I mean, it, it's, it's time consuming because kind of we have to drop everything and I have to really focus on these cases. We have to call the attorney. The attorney comes back. You know, we have to 
file it with your insurance. Uh, it, it's a whole process. I don't know if that's what you're asking about. Yeah, but those are right. Right, and, and it, then just like with budget time, you know, we have to do work, everything else falls. So I have to focus on that because that's a huge part of my job. I hope that helps. And actually this just, well, this piggybacks on that because come on, it's on. Um, so the, the rough calculation of special ed cost per student is 15800 versus the uh, potential out of district placement, which was at 88000 Correct. And please remember now we're billing for day treatment. So when we looked at that, Paul, we figured out I get a $137 per day per um, student in our day treatment that has main care. So if we had that student, we, p we come out, we get reimbursed $16,000 a month. I think that's right. Yes, yeah, $16,000 a month for that student. No, never mind. I can't, no, no, $16,000 a student, sorry. So it, it's kind of a wash for some of those kids. So you know, our, our, ma our Medicaid money will grow um, probably by 100000 That's my projection. Don't count me. Uh, but I think that will, will help offset the budget. And the, I don't know if I said this, the f uh, in the stimulus package, the main, we will be able to bill main care and Medicaid money up until October. For, it was on a mor moratorium in April. That's the last time we could bill. They moved it to October. So I'm going to quickly go into which is the big issue, which is really the stimulus package. We've got a lot of information today. It's it, the compromise between the Senate and the House. Basically, we have, in 15, we have 15 months to spend approximately 512000 about a half million dollars. It's coming in with IDA money. There's strings attached, um, and there's a lot of issues that we got to talk about. 15% of that money needs to go to um, preschool. So, and what they what they're calling it is a stimulus package, but you need to what they they really want it to, you to change the way you're doing business. And one of the we did we we the commissioner charged us today developing lists of how we can spend that money, um, and they're really and we have 15 months to spend it or you lose it. So, but, right, so, but some of the things I really want to talk to DLT about, you can develop a preschool and it can count towards your, G, your, your there's, ways to, there's ways to make money out of doing a preschool using your CDS population coming in. So I'm, I'm not going to go in there. Also, what we could possibly do, I'm just throwing this out, we could do an all day, I have a lot of students coming in through CDS, one way to do it is hire a kindergarten, another kindergarten teacher, and have, I, I need, some of these kids need to go full day. I cannot do a half day kindergarten with a child with nonverbal autism. Doesn't, doesn't make sense. So some of that money can be dedicated to that. Jeff's talked about technology, um, data, out of district placements, but you, you really have to think about how you can support it long term. Um, so it has to be really, really carefully thought out. And I think the DLT has to have a really in interesting conversation about it. But I have 15 months to spend it. And there's a certain application, and there are strings attached. I don't know what those are yet. And you can say thanks, but no thanks. I don't think any district's going to say thanks, but no thanks, because it's um, what you could do with that technology-wise would be I immense. Right, to some of it, though. I mean, if, if, if the strings attached are you are committed to um, creating a program that we can't afford, Four right. years down the two, one year down the road. Yep. that's the major, major issue. And a lot of, we don't know whether we can supplant the budget right now. So there's a lot of haggling over that. So in other words, um, say Alan says, I want you to put all your ed techs in there. And then that's kind of supplanting the budget. And then the problem is in two years, in, in 16 months, you're going to have to pay for that again. So Tom, there's, there's concerns around that. Tom, does this, does this money, can it also be used for research-based programs to support yep. RTI? Yes. Site where soft licenses? Yep, 15% of that can go. There's, certain, there's a lot of RTI in there, but again, the major focus, and it goes not only for IDA, it goes for Title I monies, because you're going to have a new application for that. It's, it is um, really towards child early childhood education. The emphasis is to focus on early intervention. It's based on research. And it's supposed to be a stimulus. You're supposed to, it's a stimulus to create jobs. So for example, if we lose a kindergarten, uh, uh, an elementary teacher, if you can refocus and do all day kindergarten, that's supposed to stimulate. That's for example, one example. For a year. Correct. Or two years, actually. 15 months, you can probably get two years out of that. But it's better than losing the person. So 
Sounds like we've got a lot to talk about with that. Yeah, it's yeah. That's I, and I don't know how you want to structure that's that. That's a whole so. workshop in itself. It sounds like. Um, any other questions? Budget-related questions for Dom? But I think I'll be very popular. Sounds Just like kidding. it. <laughs> okay. Um, I'd like to thank all the uh, district leadership folks for their presentations and the questions. I'm sure there's going to be more. Um, we're going to move. I know we're a tiny bit uh, late, but we're going to move to public comment. I know there's some folks from the public who've been here, um, and I guess, I think, is that um, set up for public? Okay, so if you have a question, comment, if you'd come up to the microphone and um, address us. I have um, a couple questions. One, um, because I was a resource teacher and I had a caseload of 35 when I was first a resource teacher before the days of learning strategists and teaching strategists, so that Warren, either by the principals um, leading uh, IEP team meetings or uh, usually the caseload paperwork piece that was part of the work of the teacher. So really, those caseload numbers, you should factor in those three teaching mm -hmm. strategists, full-time teaching strategists. Yep, and, 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 what, and again, it's a little bit different than Portland, and I know we've had this conversation before. I really view these, they're really teacher leader positions, in my mind. So they really work, mm -hmm. and I, I know most learning strategists don't sit on, st I don't know if they do, most of them, but I've had the conversations, they sit on SST, they're not only develop it, they're not doing all the written notices. No, but it's not mandated that those positions right. exist. Right, but it's, it, mm -hmm. it, it helps us with data, helps us moving mm -hmm. forward, mm -hmm. um, it helps the teachers focus on teaching. If, if I had my resource from teachers and life skills teachers have to do the written notice mm -hmm. on top of you know coordinating when these IEP meetings are going to be, which is a nightmare. Um, it would definitely impact how kids are making progress. But it is important, I believe, to inform mm -hmm. the public and that those numbers factor in that those are teachers. So if you have two res how many resource teachers at Pond Cove? Two. Two resource teachers at Pond Cove, and how many self-contained? We have w we have w one. Self, we have right. one FLS teacher there, uh -huh. and one the, the choices teacher sp is K eight, so she goes back and okay, forth. So half you have you yep. three and a half. Yep. But you actually have four and a yep. half. Yep. And it, that's so I think those numbers should yep. those caseloads should be those that needs to be factored in for sure. correct accounting, really. Yep. Um, but I you know um, then another thing is response to intervention, calling it an unfunded mandate. It's just requiring that you use all teaching strategies that there are and collect data accurately before you call a child disabled, which is what you do when you refer a child or qualify a child to special ed. It's, it's requiring that regular ed maximize what regular ed can do. That's what our work is in schools. And to say that struggling learners or kids that are non-disabled shouldn't be our responsibility. I, there's, I think that we need to have some discussion about that before we start beating up on this notion of unfunded mandates and being clear about what we're talking about. And a concern I have at Pond Cove is you have reading recovery. It was installed 15 years ago. It's, it, I don't believe it's part of the RTI. That's an intervention that happens outside the RTI process currently at Pond Cove. No, it, 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 is, it is part of the RTI process. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, the kids would go through there, and we've had many, many instances where, um, for example, I'll just take Suzanne, would be working with a student, and if she suspects there's a processing disorder mm -hmm. or, some, or some area like that, she mm -hmm. could, she'll stop, she'll bring it back to SST, she brings the data back, they decide as a team mm -hmm. whether they're going to make a referral. And Tom, I'm sorry I was speaking for you, but mm -hmm. um, they... They make a referral. We'll go to a first step. So every single child that's receiving services from the reading halftime reading recovery, halftime early childhood literacy specialist, every single one of those chi children have been put through the RTI process, and those services are part of that plan. They've gone through some aspects of RTI. It depends on how you want to do it. The classroom mm -hmm. teachers, and, and Tom has pushed really more classroom teachers to do more RTI in the regular classroom instead mm -hmm. of just making... Here's a referral. Right. Um, so he's kind of getting inundated. Um, well, I wouldn't say that. SST is getting a lot more action than, say, I am, because that's the, really the first place to go. Uh -huh. And they will send out, you know, the, the literacy teachers to go into the um, 
classroom to help out classroom teachers. Mm -hmm. I use my consultant, my behavioral consultant, mm -hmm. to go in, my OT, my speech yep. and language. We're really kind to, we really have big defined menu, it. A, a big menu yep. choice. And it's really all focused okay, through right. Tom at, at his SST, he, mm -hmm. the whole school. So it has to filter through him. Mm -hmm. We have certain open sl slots with our related service, like mm -hmm. OT and speech and language, and even social work. If mm -hmm. we suspect a student might have you know, autism, which right. we have lots of them, um, we will, my social worker is really trained in methodologies that can do that. So it, it really is, it starts out there, and that's where that, going back to the strategist, that's a key mm -hmm. component to that SST uh, team, because it's a link. There's, but I just, those yep. numbers need to be accurate. Those caseload right. numbers aren't accurate until yep. those are, because I would wonder, does Yarmouth have the same number per pupil? To, you know, that, need, that position needs to, because yep. those positions are not mandated within the special ed regulations. Correct, they're okay. not. But, but they, they serve and other and roles. I just have one more thing. Yep. Um, a math lab was added, and it's, it's much more, to me, the question is more uh, that there's one math program in Pond Cove, and that's the Chicago math in the regular classroom. That needs to be looked at. If you Google and research um, reading recovery as well, uh, um, research on reading recovery, and reviews of Chicago math, there's some scathing reviews. And my child, um, with the Chicago math, her profile, she's an average cognitive student, average achievement. Her profile is not one that lends itself to Chicago math and have one program and that we add a whole teacher and a whole intervention before we look at could there be a wider variety of instruction within the regular ed, ed classroom before we do that. I just think we need to add, as it seems as though this budget has been keeping all the structures in place and peeling away things within it. Got a K-8 school. How about one principal, one assistant principal, one office for our K-8 school? We need to think bolder and bigger. I mean, th and, and, and rethink paradigms. This is a time to be creative. And I just, I. You know, I know you've spent tons of time. I just think it just has a feel of kind of group think, and I'd like to see it kind of expanded, and I appreciate you allowing the public to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Yeah. Yes? I forgot to say, you if you wouldn't mind stating your name so that it's on the tape, sure, too. Sure, Bill DeSena. Sure, um, thank you for your time and uh, the education. Um, I have a... Uh, concern when I hear there's a possibility, if I interpreted it correctly, of uh, losing a guidance counselor in the high school, um, but I'm confused as to why we need te uh, guidance, uh, I think you said one and a half in, what, one through four is your responsibility? Can you educate me as to why that's a function? Is it the true guidance in the sense that it would be in a high school. Thank you. Uh, no, it's it's totally unlike uh, their traditional view of guidance, which would be more the high school one of guiding kids toward um, college or career. It's we're using the term more of school counselor to help with some of the skills that. Uh, I think Jeff is dealing with too, help kids with uh, socializing skills and cognitive um, skills at the lower level. So it's not a matter of, of placing kids. It's um, family support, student support. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> the last point, I think um, it's admirable and um, that you're going through this, but from an outsider looking in, you're really having to struggle hard to save nickels and dimes, and this probably may not be the place to bring this up. But I think when you um, are going to have to make significant cuts if you are to synchronize the pattern of what's going on in our world today, you really have to look at the salaries and the benefits, and I think that's probably the responsibility of the board and sit down and renegotiate the contracts. That's my observation. I don't think that's 
going to be easy for the board members or the superintendents. I think it takes a professional negotiator to have some impact on that. Uh, that or you're just going to have to, if 2% if doesn't fly and you get knocked down to some other level, you've got two choices. You either cut severely people out or you share the pain. And that just takes a tough negotiator, I think, to sit down and work this out, a professional. That's my only comment. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Anybody else? Just looking around the curtain. No, I guess not. Okay. Well, we're six minutes over, but I think that's okay for considering all the things that we certainly dealt with a lot of information. Um, our next meeting will be on February 24th at 7 o'clock here. Um, and we will be hearing from... It will be, excuse me. It will be technology, uh, athletics, uh, community services, and what have I? Oh, and uh, CIP and maintenance will be the four at that, that time. Great. Thank you. Um, anybody else have anything before we adjourn? Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Oh, wait a minute. One more thing. I just want to make the um, mention that uh, a number of months ago you took a, or a letter of um, retirement from Barbara um, as a bus driver. And um, she has been giving of her time ever since then and has not retired. Um, because we have not been able to fill the slot and she graciously said until we were able to fill the slot she would continue to drive. Well, uh, effective tomorrow will be her last day and it does appear that we will finally be able to hire somebody to fill the slot but um, she has given of her time graciously for the last two months and I wanted to publicly acknowledge that. Thank you very much. We have a lot of dedicated people. Okay, thank you everyone. We'll see you on the 24th.